he expressed the need to um, uh, to improve this and uh, to enhance, uh, basically it's enhancing the capacity of all the implementing agencies. And uh, he also informed us about the need to shift from single project-based assessment to more of cumulative impact assessment and strategic environmental assessment. So uh, this was a topic which was also uh, mentioned uh, by Dr. Asha. Uh, the next presentation we had from Mr. Rob Ament. He is from the Center for Large Landscapes, and he talked mainly about the, the LISA project, which they implemented last year. LISA standing for Linear Infrastructure uh, for Safeguards in Asia. And uh, this was a study which was financed by the USAID. And uh, under this, they had studied um, the issues on linear infrastructure focusing on roads, rails and transmission lines in 28 different countries. And uh, the main purpose was to understand the capacity and training needs and to understand also the kind of challenges that are being faced in, um, in integrating uh, ecologically friendly measures in these kind of infrastructure projects. So uh, it was quite interesting and he showed there a bit of their analytical work that they had done, where they had done a lot of spatial analysis and they had done um, biodiversity analysis. And from their analytical work, uh, what came out very clearly was that the Therai Arc landscape, which we learned about yesterday, is a very uh, important part of biodiversity in the entire continent of Asia. So this is not just a small region thing within South Asia or the Himalayan region. It's of uh, significance for the entire continent. So therefore, we have to really be careful as we move forward with our projects, uh, particularly in the Therai part of Nepal. And another interesting uh, thing that uh, he mentioned was that um, they were able to digitize about 81,000 kilometer of uh, linear infrastructure uh, for the 28 countries. And this is proposed infrastructure to be financed by international organizations, uh, not by, by the countries. So, and this 81,000 kilometer, uh, he said, they found that it, it runs or is located uh, close to many protected areas. And he mentioned a huge number of 363 protected areas. Um, so again, this is another uh, quite alarming figure and we need to be very careful as we move forward in implementing uh, our linear infrastructure projects. And uh, for Nepal, uh, an interesting observation, which I think we should pay attention to is that they found that uh, when they mapped the biodiversity rich areas in Nepal, it does not necessarily coincide with the location of the protected area. So that, that means there are some biodiversity important areas which are located, but which are not designated as protected area. So therefore we need to be mindful in terms of um, ensuring, uh, avoiding and minimizing impacts in those areas which are not uh, designated as protected areas. And uh, lastly, he talked about uh, the literature and the available data. And I think this is also what we are seeing over the course of the presentations in this training is that there is much more data and information on the larger iconic charismatic and the large mammal species, but less information on the invertebrates and the reptiles, you know, and the smaller species, uh, which are actually also very important for keeping the entire ecosystem functioning. So we need to do a better job in uh, collecting data on these other forms of species. Uh, Dr. Rodney, he did a presentation on behalf of uh, Tony Clevenger, who, who could not join us. So uh, Dr. Rodney uh, talked about the ecological impacts of uh, uh, basically the current practices and design for mitigating road impacts on wildlife. And uh, he ran us through, you know, the conceptual um, issues in terms of the kind of impacts that uh, road and rail projects have. And uh, an important uh, point that he conveyed is that it's never an ideal situation. We cannot build, we cannot do everything that, you know, we would like to do. There's always some time constraint or budget constraint. So therefore we need to prioritize uh, the options that we have. And it has to be very site specific based on the local uh, site conditions, the location, the issue, and we need to maximize the use of measures which will have multiple benefits. For example, having one crossing structure 
to benefit both the larger mammals as well as the smaller wildlife species, as well as serve the purpose of, uh, you know, um, facilitating the movement of water and also addressing climate change issues. So we really need to make the best out of the situation that we are in. And um, in terms of the data, he's saying, though we have been uh, doing wildlife crossing studies globally for uh, more than about 30 years now, but uh, what we data that we have is more uh, very much focused on things like road kills and, you know, the issues with are within the immediate vicinity of the infrastructure, but there is less data on the more sort of, I guess, gray sort of the impacts on the demographics and, you know, the, the gene flow of wildlife species. So these are the more uh, complicated um, topics, but at the same time is very, very important. We need to understand what kind of impacts our projects are having on the demography of wildlife species and, and the gene flow. So this is something which uh, is still uh, lacking and we need to do a better job on this. Lastly, a very important point from his presentation for us to pay attention is he showed about uh, the slide on the effectivity of different kinds of mitigation measures. And there was a study where they found that uh, there was an 83% reduction in mortality of large uh, animals when there was a combination of fencing and crossing structure used. And then the uh, reduction in mortality reduced with other measures such as detection system. And then he mentioned that wildlife reflectors is actually not that effective. There was only a 1% reduction in wildlife mortality. So I think this is something which we need to keep in mind, um, especially with the road projects that we are going to embark on uh, immediately in the next one or two years. Uh, we had a great presentation from Clara and Ben, if I can combine the two of them, because it's, it talks about all the online tools and resources and um, the modeling tools that are available out there. And we learned from Ben that, uh, you know, the, the process that was followed in conducting the ecological assessment for the Narangat Hetao de Patlaya Road, though experts were located all over the world in Canada, US, Europe, Nepal, Manila, uh, it was still possible to uh, have this nice assessment with the teamwork uh, because of the advantage of technology. And it was possible to have, uh, you know, data collection managed by Sumanji and Bhuvanji, and they would use the one, two, three, the, the roadkill app, and they were able to collect the data, and then that would feed into the server. And then Ben, who's based in Canada, he could then already analyze the data and start generating maps. So this is really a fantastic. And um, Clara did a very nice presentation on the findings of the study, which was done for the NHP road. And, um, we could see the, the tools where uh, they looked into uh, the Maxent tool, which is looking at the studying the habitat suitability for the kind of species that are there in the local area. And they had studied a total of about 17 species. And then there is the other tool called Circuitscape, which is another uh, open source model, which uh, models the habitat connectivity for each of these species. And as a result of this modeling exercise, they were able to understand uh, exactly where are the key, uh, you know, uh, crossing points and important points for wildlife and where we have to design uh, mitigation structures. So um, this is a really um, a, a big uh, development, which has uh, grown very rapidly in the past couple of years. And especially during COVID, you know, everybody is working online and meeting virtually. So I think we really need to take advantage of this. And from our end, from ADB's end, we would like to um, provide more and more capacity building on these kind of tools and technology in order to uh, make the ecological impact assessment process more efficient and reduce the burden for our uh, implementing agencies. Um, then uh, very quickly, uh, sorry, I'm taking time. Uh, we had the very nice presentation from Gordon and I really liked um, his statement that natural capital is a special gift for us. 
and uh, we need to uh, find ways to maintain it uh, properly uh, and ensure that uh, we preserve it and save it even for the future generations, for our children and grandchildren. Uh, and the natural capital is there for us. We use it directly in terms of, I mean, for the road construction, we are collecting stones, boulders. These are all natural capital. Uh, so we need to uh, use it, but in a correct manner so that we don't destroy for example, when we extract sand from the riverbed, we should do it in a sustainable manner and we should not destroy uh, the riverbed and uh, the, the ecology within it. So um, I think uh, that's the key message that natural capital is a gift to us. It benefits us, but we should use it in a way that it benefits us as well as our children and grandchildren. Uh, lastly, we had the presentation from Dr. Asha uh, focusing on the cumulative impacts uh, and her, her, the title of her presentation was managing multiple linear infrastructure uh, impacts and uh, I would just like to point out uh, mainly that figure which I think you will remember with the two umbrellas on having many EIAs versus one SEA. So uh, I think it was clear that uh, the bigger umbrella with the strategic environmental assessment is actually um, better, or I would say a combination of the two to have the SEA come first and the EIA. Uh, but uh, though we have these tools, uh, she also pointed out that both is not perfect. And uh, there are always like uh, pros and cons in using both the approaches. However, we need to do our best to follow both SEA and then also uh, EIA so that we are able to capture both the larger landscape level issues uh, and then within the EIA, we are able to focus on the project specific issues in reference to the larger landscape issues. And uh, one point that she mentioned is that ecologists speak a different language and engineers speak a different language. So workshop today, I think we have ecologists and engineers, and I hope after this workshop, we will all start uh, speaking uh, the same language. Uh, because we really need to bring um, ecologists and engineers on the same table and uh, try to find solutions to, you know, uh, have better uh, ecologically friendly um, features uh, integrated in, in the transport infrastructure projects. So um, she mentioned that landscape connectivity and functionality, this is something which is very important and we should not lose, lose sight of this. And we often lose sight of this when we focus only on uh, EIA, which is a very narrow approach. And it also refers back to the presentation from Mr. Prakash Kaudal, when he said that we should move away from project specific and have more cumulative and uh, strategic environmental assessment. And lastly, Dr. Asha, um, shared that there is a good example of uh, following this uh, sort of uh, multi-sector engagement and having this uh, you know, mitigation hierarchy being properly applied on a larger scale uh, across uh, different uh, sectors and uh, different stakeholders. And she gave this example uh, from Africa. And uh, we will try to find that document and uh, share it with everybody. So uh, with that, I will uh, stop my recap and I will hand over to Bendraji. Thank you, Karmaji. Uh, actually, there was the uh, uh, schedule for the site visit yesterday in the two road sections. One was the Narangat Mugling and another was the NHP road, particularly on the Barandabar corridor. However, in uh, Narangat Mugling, the aim was to look or observe the two already constructed wildlife crossings. Uh, however, uh, uh, prior to the site visit, we discussed among the participants and uh, even Gordon and the Clara as well. And there was the, with the limitation, limitation of the time, uh, they, everybody agrees to much focus on the Baranda Bar corridor and NHP road section. However, most of the participants have already seen the already constructed two uh, these wildlife crossing in uh, uh, Narangat Mugling Road. However, in the bus, we discuss the uh, like the discuss about the those crossings already constructed. The major observation importance of those crossing is very high because the those that crossing is the uh, lies in the Tarai Arc uh, landscape, which is the north 
uh, east west corridor for the connectivity purpose for the wildlife and the particularly observation uh, sharing the observation on their own was that the size could have been increased or the it could have been addressed better what is at the moment done however those crossings uh, constructed are uh, maybe uh, good for the smaller kind of the animals but not uh, good enough for the large animals that was the observation on the narangar bukwal from far however we drive to and started uh, from the starting point of the barandabar corridor from the uh, western side and the, we discuss first uh, on the importance of the barandabar corridor and everybody agrees and knows about the the location of that particular corridor and importance of that corridor everybody knows that the chiton national park is hi highly rich on the biodiversity particularly in the different species large to small animals and wildlife and the, there is the only one a uh, small section of the strip of the forest which is the barandabar corridor uh, the which is the 3.9 km in width uh, and the 87.9 km square area which connects the this particular uh, cnp chiton national park to the northern side of the forest which the connects to the two important connect connectivity corridor one is the tal tarai arkland is the east west connectivity Uh, and the another is the char chitwan to annapurna landscape which is the north south corridor uh, connectivity corridor for the wildlife and the, with this uh, like the every part all participants agree on the importance of that particular barandabar corridor and uh, in the barandabar corridor we are uh, briefed by the garden that the, there are the five uh, culverts or the cross drainage existing cross drainage Uh, there but uh, which are very small and we uh, observe the three out of five uh, the these are the pipe culverts maybe the those may be used in past by the reptiles or the very very small animals but not by the uh, like the uh, med medium size animal or the large animals most of the animals crossed north south in this corridor uh, on surface Uh, and the, particularly considering the north, these uh, connectivity, these land escapes, Tal ta, ta, and the Chal, uh, which is basically east-west highway has a barrier on the a, a barrier on the connectivity of the Chal Tal to the Chitwan National Park. Something uh, something need to be the addressed in case of the any intervention on this particular section of the road. That was also discussed, and the, there are the lot of. thoughts like the whether the it can be the connect uh, overpass for the animals and uh, there was the options from the some of the participants that that will not work uh, it should be the road should go fly over for the uh, vehicles and the uh, beneath the existing road should be uh, uh, reclaimed for the forest so that the natural connectivity for the wildlife underneath the fly over that kind of the solution was also proposed by the few participant and the, some of the participant says uh, like uh, raising the embankment and providing the few uh, in the few sections like uh, in the 3.9 km maybe the 5 6 underpasses that kind of the all kind of the solutions were discussed and the uh, most of the uh, with the those discussion we realized that however the importance of the wildlife crossing Uh, most of the participants understand, and the other two locations we stopped uh, uh, were also the pipe culvert within the Barandabar corridor, uh, which are all the also in the similar condition, like the uh, not good enough for the animals. Maybe the reptiles uh, they they might have used those those pipe culverts, and next section we stopped at the Khairi Kola Bridge. Which is the three span uh, bridge with the each span of the in the uh, approximately twenty meter total le uh, length is a sixty two meter. In that one, we all the parts went went beneath the uh, bridge and the look that the height is quite good enough with the uh, more than eight meter height. And the like the discussion and the agreement was that uh, uh, this kind of the stuff. However, that location Perikola is not very much. uh 
for the wildlife crossing because the both sides is the cultivated land and the village. Maybe sometimes some wildlife may have used, but not frequently. But uh, the discussion was that this, this kind of the structure is good enough for the wildlife crossing because the three span with the 20 meter span each and the height more than 80 meters. That was the conclusion. This kind of structure is quite good enough to uh, restore for the wildlife connectivity. The next one, we uh, stopped at the section where the slab culvert was there, Chatra Kola. The, this is the three cell slab culvert, total nine meter with the each span of the 2.5 to three meter. And height is around the uh, three meter. And the discussion among the participants and conclusion was that uh, like this particular section also not uh, in the connectivity corridor of the wildlife, but the, this is the example. In the case of the wildlife connectivity, what can be the improvement done on this kind of the structure? The conclusion on that this part uh, was the from the participant as well as the Gordon, Clara and everyone was that if we observe this kind of structure in the wildlife corridor, it has to be uh, better uh, heights should be raised to good enough for the larger animal or the mid-size animal, or depending upon the like the assessment of the what kind of the animal are uh, passing through that. And uh, particularly if the three cell culvert can be converted to the minor bridges with the single span, that will uh, uh, be the far best because that will allow uh, more um, uh, openness index as well as the uh, that can be used by the larger animals. These things are observed and the most of the uh, people's observation was I briefed here. Thank you Gordon and Clara uh, who gave the uh, who provided the all the feedbacks and the in that particular corridor uh, because of the time region uh, I think the participant or the whole team could not go further beyond to the Chaitra Kola and came back. This is the overall summary of the uh, yesterday's site visit. Uh, like the, I will request the participant if I missed anything. Now I pass on the mic to uh, Deepanji and Sobhaji. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Uh, thank you, Parma, uh, for your comprehensive review of the studies program. Uh, actually, if you have missed anything from the presentation, we get it from you. It was really a good uh, recap of the studies. Uh, thank you, Bhattasar, for the site visit and its description. Actually, we enjoyed it a lot. Not only we, the travelers in the road also enjoyed it thoroughly with us. Uh, Let's uh, start the another session of the program. We have in the recap session of this program. Uh, let's continue the uh, presentation. Uh, this presentation is based on the case studies uh, from various institutes, say uh, from our neighboring country also, we have the uh, case studies. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, uh, or say we have a uh, case study presentation on design and monitoring uh, Nagpur India NH7 tiger crossing structures uh, from Bilal Habib, conservation biologist. Uh, I have I would like to introduce him and sort uh, description about him. Uh, Bilal Habib, conservation biologist, Wildlife Institute of India. Bilal is focusing on the integration of quantitative and interdisciplinary approach to conservation challenges. With deep interest in nature conservation, he completed a doctoral research on the ecology of the Indian wolf in the great Indian bustard sanctuary. He also worked as wildlife survey program manager for the Wildlife Conservation Society's Afghanistan Biodiversity Project. Uh, I would like to request Mr. Bila Babi for his presentation. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Bilal Habib from Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun. Today I'll be talking to you about the monitoring of animal underpasses on NH44, which is one of the national highways in India. And this highway has been there from last 100 years. And this highway came from upgradation during the year 2010. And it almost took us 10 years to implement mitigation measures on this particular highway. And Anyway, so I'll be talking about uh, how we reach to that particular stage that how we decided that the highway that these, these mitigation measures should be constructed on these particular places and from last three years we are conti continuously monitoring these mitigation measures and I will tell you how animals have started initially using these uh, mitigation measures and how is situ situation right now. 
and if you see that uh, there there are series of nine under process uh, this highway was initially uh, named as nh7 but now it has been changed to nh uh, 44 and this this particular highway passes through one of the tiger resorts in our country and very interesting thing is that uh, these underpasses are across the similar habitats that means the habitat does not vary across these underpasses but we have an underpasses of different categories we have an underpasses as small as 50 meters and we have underpasses as large as 750 meters so this gives us an opportunity to test the efficacy of different sizes of underpasses at the same place uh, same place in the sense the habitat is same topography is same the type of wildlife is same the wildlife densities are same across all these underpasses and construction was completed uh, during the year 2018 and from 2019 march onwards uh, we started monitoring these underpasses using camera traps and i will be discussing with you uh, the 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 results from these uh, monitorings and and we have a very simple basic uh, design uh, like these pillars which were there uh, on which these underpasses are built are ranging from 15 to 20 30 meters from each other so we placed one camera trap on each pillar so it was a by default design and 15 to 30 meters is enough distance to which your uh, camera trap will be triggered if an animal pop passes uh, in front of these camera and uh, very interesting thing uh, in terms of number of species we have 22 species of uh, wildlife using these uh, structures we have excluded uh, langurs and rhesus macaques big macaques because uh, you know their use is influenced by uh, the highways uh, because of the feeding uh, by the local people and interestingly from 2019 to 2020 we have almost seen 193 percent increase in the number of you uh, uh, in the number of crossings uh, uh, during this particular year and if you say during the year 2019 we have around 5673 crossings during the year 2020 we have around 16594 crossings while well, uh, during 2021 till december 2021 we have around 19309 crossings and very interestingly we this uh, these underpasses are across uh, six kilometers of road and we have 16 different tigers using these underpasses and we have never thought of that this smaller stretch of road will be used by 16 tigers so which was very surprising to us that such a huge number of tigers will be using these particular underpasses and uh, we we try to define uh, usage versus cross so if uh, you have a photographs of animals just crossing the structure from one end to the other end we define it as it as a cross whereas if uh, animals stay there underpass and are doing different type of activities like drinking water like predators trying to hunt animals so that we consider it as uh, as a usage by the animal animals and you see that in terms of the crossing you see the smaller structures they are just used by the animals while moving from other places by from, from one side of the protected area to other side whereas larger structures are not only used for crossing animals try to spend more time under these uh, these structures so as as soon as the habitat becomes more conducive for the animals uh, with the growth of the vegetation so animals start using these structures as a as a habitat as they use the normal habitat in protected area and not all animals uh, they use these underpasses equally so this particular graph shows the time span how many days after completion of the work when these when the work under these underpasses was completed and when these uh, underpasses were dedicated for the use of uh, by, by the use of the wildlife you say that as soon as we started putting camera traps the cheetah, jungle cat, god, hare, tiger, palm, sweet, neil guy, wild, wild pig, mongoose, they started using these underpasses within a couple of days. So as soon as we started putting up camera traps, these animals starting using their animals. But interestingly, uh, some of the animals like, like jackal, rusty spotted cat, pangolin, Indian bull, barking deer and chow singa, they started using these underpasses almost after two to six months. That means every time has a different response towards these underpasses so some animals start immediately using these underpasses whereas for some species uh, it takes a time to uh, to use these
access for processing. So we have like even uh, after a, a year of a monitoring, after two years of monitoring, in the second year we have a first time users like the Neil guy. Neil guy males were using these underpasses from the year one, but Neil guy females and the young ones they started using these underpasses after year two. We have uh, leopards uh, started using this after year two. We have a yes tigers started using these underpasses from year one just after the two days when they were dedicated for the wildlife use but the females with the young ones they started to use these underpasses after one year and we have now the cubs of all different sizes we have a tiger cubs uh, which are of the age of uh, eight to nine months we have a tiger cubs which are of the age of three months we have a tiger cubs which are of the age of four months using these underpasses regularly on daily basis uh, uh, while going from one side of Area to other protected area. We have uh, like uh, wild pigs with uh, the lot of piglets using these underpasses. Wild dogs is a very interesting find. Wild dogs not only use these underpasses, wild dogs play these underpasses, wild dogs use these pillars for scent marking, wild dogs are using these underpasses for hunting, wild dogs bring their cubs. Uh, bring their puppies to these underpasses and puppies spend a lot of time. So for wild dogs to me these structures are, are like their normal habitats. There is no effect, uh, uh, no negative effect uh, of these underpasses on wild dogs and wolves. They started using uh, uh, after a year. They were not initial users. And we have now even the leopard females with their young ones using these underpasses. Uh, wild dogs, as, uh, as I already told, they are marking their territories. They are using these underpasses like their own, like the, like the normal habitat. Tigers have started scent marking these underpasses. So over the time, uh, tigers realize that probably these underpasses are a part of their habitat. So they not only crystallize these underpasses, they go and scent mark uh, the pillars of these underpasses. And we have a cheetah doing all sort of uh, uh, behaviors under these passes. They're fighting. They show. They are trying to show the dominance behaviors. Females are with the young ones doing all sort of activities under these underpasses. And for wild dogs. It's a heaven. It's a resting spot. It's a hunting spot. It's a spot where they be, they bring their young ones to play. And uh, nationalization of the systems is it's a very interesting thing. I will uh, like your attention on the date. This was a photograph on 15 July 2009 at 8:29 at a.m. Uh, we had a little bit of a showers of the rain, and there was a small puddle of water under these underpasses. And wild dogs came and started using this small puddle of water as as a watch hole. And after a year, just after a couple of days, there was again rainfall and there was a puddle of water again farmer and the wild dogs again came and started using this, uh, using the, using the same area as a water hole. And the difference between these two photographs, if you see the previous photograph once again, uh, once again, if you see the previous photograph and if you go the photograph which is ahead, you will see that there is a nationalization of the vegetation under these underpasses. That means these underpasses are more become uh, becoming natural. So we also try, uh, try to say that can these crossing structures mimic natural habitat? They, that means all these are these habitats similar uh, to what uh, uh, how the animals use uh, the natural habitat. So in order to prove that what we did, we put camera traps on natural openings in a forest where there were no underpasses and replicated the design what we had under the underpasses and we had found that there were some negative performers and there were some uh, some positive performers so for example the samba and cheetah they were using their areas natural habitats in a more in a much better way than they were using uh, the underpasses but for species like hare and wild dogs they were using underpasses much better than how we got their captures or how got we got their uh, uh, their activity patterns under these underpasses so there are positive performers when you compare the uh, the activities of these animals under the underpasses and when you compare the activities of these under these animals under natural habitats so yes this is this is this data is based on two years of monitoring we expect to change this over time and that will also help us to understand how these underpasses become naturalized over the time how much of time 
for a specific species it takes that when they when they use these underpasses as a natural habitats as of now we can say that for for wild dogs for hares it's just a matter of time it's just a couple of a couple of months as soon as we these underpasses were dedicated for the use but for the species uh, sambal and the cheetah uh, i think we have to wait a bit more to see that how these underpasses become a natural part of the uh, we were also trying to see uh, how is the movement under these underpasses, the movement under uh, crossing data similar to the natural habitat, species richness uh, with respect to the crossing structures and mean species rich richness increases with the crossing structures. So very interesting thing you see this is species richness, this is the size of the underpasses. Okay, you know that if we have a small, these are the, these are the underpasses. Uh, from 50 to 60 meters, you know, only five or six species use these type of underpasses. So now you have a diff, you have a very definite answer that what type of species can use these underpasses. Whereas if you go from uh, 800 to 300 meters, you have a more species using these underpasses. And definitely, if you go for the larger structures, you have much more species using these underpasses. That means there is definitely a choice for the size of underpasses to be used by the different species. So when we are going to decide to design an underpass for a species, we should not consider only one particular species. We should consider the multiple species and we should consider the underpasses in such a way that these underpasses are going to help multiple species to cross from one side of the area and other side of the area. So this is very critical. But about the design of the underpasses and I already told that wild dogs for a wild dogs was a heaven for them and we also try to see that how activity pattern of the different species especially the wild dogs and the predators uh, under these underpasses and we are also trying to prove that do these underpasses become a prey traps so there was a, there's a there's a general thought that if you have an underpasses over the time probably predators will learn that these are the areas where the prey is crossing frequently and probably predators may start using these underpasses as a prey traps and probably that is going to influence how prey and a predator is going to use these underpasses over time so we try to prove this also whether there is any influence and and is there an influence of the size we try to estimate what's the latency what 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 is the meaning of a latency so if a prey has crossed if a cheetah has crossed the underpass at 10 after how long uh, that the other predators has crossed these underpasses and this shows that uh, and we also try to compare this in the natural habitat so what is the behavior of if you have a if you have a photograph of a tiger leopard or a wild dog in a in a camera trap so before that and after that how what is the time gap between the capture of the prey and the predators in a natural habitats and underpasses and we definitely have seen that so that these underpasses are not as a prey traps you see the difference uh, ranges from in a natural habitat it's around 170 minutes whereas in underpasses it's around 156 minutes to 203 minutes and 65 minutes and we also have seen a very drastic decrease in the late latency on smaller underpasses so critical take home message if you have smaller underpasses there is a chance that these underpasses are going to be the prey traps. Whereas if you have a larger underpasses, these larger underpasses can negate that effect of prey trap. So, so we have to visualize if you are making a smaller underpasses, then we have to think are these smaller underpasses going to negate the effect of these underpasses become as a prey trap. So that's a very important aspect when you consider the design of these underpasses. So uh, we also talked about like if you consider a single species, so we have a 22 different species using these underpasses. So this is one of the examples of the only tigers. You see that underpasses which were more than 500 meters, so 750 meter underpasses were mostly used by the tigers. So you have seven different tigers, seven different individuals using underpasses which were more than 750 meters. So you have a 60 meter underpass, 50 meter underpass, 80 meter underpass, 100 meter underpass, 65 meter underpass. They were not so frequently used by the tigers. We have a 100 meter underpass which was frequently used by the tigers. That means if we are thinking about the mitigation measures in tiger landscapes we can't think about the underpasses of 50 meter 40 meter or 30 meters we definitely have to think underpasses of larger uh, size because larger the underpasses 
I think more tiger individuals, more number of individuals are going to use these underpasses. If you have a smaller tiger, a smaller underpasses, definitely the tigers are going to use. But the number of tigers using these particular underpasses uh, may increase, which probably say that if you have a smaller underpasses, there may be very strong presence of a scent of one particular tiger. Probably the other tigers may not use it. But if you have a larger underpasses, it provides an opportunity for n number of individuals to cross at different places under the same underpasses, which enhances the use of underpasses by multiple individuals. I think when we are designing underpasses, uh, we have considered that particular aspect. Uh, we have 16, 16 different individuals during the last year. And uh, these some of these individuals were the part of the protected area. And some of the individuals are exclusively in this particular area, which are using uh, this one. And yes, uh, Based on our monitoring of last three years, uh, there are some critical recommendations like vegetation cover near underpasses increases increases the use by the herbivores. So if we have to consider that herbivores should more often use these underpasses, we definitely have to manage the vegetation around these underpasses and, and do the measures that there is a vegetation which is conducive for the moment of underpasses. And one of the most critical aspect is human disturbance. Remember, even if we are going to spend a lot of money on these underpasses, but if there is a disturbance, human disturbance around these underpasses these underpasses are not going to use by wildlife and very important take-home message is that smaller underpasses can't buffer human disturbance human disturbance whereas larger underpasses they definitely buffer this human disturbance so if you have a larger underpasses larger underpasses gives an option of uh, use by multiple species so you have a community level underpasses it also gives you an option of multiple tigers using multiple indu tiger individuals using these underpasses and larger underpasses also gives an option of uh, uh, minimizing the impact of the human disturbance whereas in case of a smaller underpasses smaller underpasses have an option of becoming prey traps so in, ca in case of smaller underpasses there is more chances of human disturbance will be will which may which which is going to impact the use of wildlife whereas larger underpasses buffer everything so larger underpasses have definitely much more advantage over smaller underpasses but now the most important question is how large the underpass should be one of our papers is uh, uh, is under review and as per that particular paper probably we think that uh, the 300 meter underpasses are going to minimize the most of the impact so if somebody says that what's the one figure which you are going to tell should be the size of the underpasses especially in tiger landscapes probably i will recommend the underpasses uh, of 200 to 300 uh, meter size we have just published a paper in a diversity which is about prey trap it is available online you people uh, can access that paper and and read about the trip prey trap hypothesis and uh, about the size of underpasses the i think that paper will be out soon and as soon as that paper will be uh, uh, available i will definitely share with you people and that will help us in designing the mitigation measures across the tiger landscapes in a much better way with this i uh, thank you all and especially the adb uh, for giving me an opportunity to present in front of you especially the tony who has been uh, persistent uh, in writing mails and saying that no you have to be there you have to present I'm sorry I was not able to be present physically with you people, but I hope uh, I was able to tell you something about the use of underpasses in India. And now we have a project, uh, Wildlife Institute of India has a project uh, of road ecology in Nepal. Uh, and I think uh, now there's a more and more opportunities to interact with you people directly in near future soon. Thank you so much and all the best uh, with your workshop. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Aviv, for your presentation. Uh, from your presentation, we get to know that the number of wildlife that are using the crossings are increasing uh, day by day or, so, or say month by month. Uh, they have they are been habitual or say they are been comfortable for the use of these crossings. If we construct this life of crossings, which attract them to use that type of crossing, it will be more efficient or say it will be more useful for them too. Uh, now it's time for second presentation. Uh, this presentation is on the topics of Design India, uh, NS37 East West Highway, uh, Kaziranga NP Assam. Uh, this is this case study will be presented by Santanu Bhattacharya, additional chief engineer mechanical uh, PW 
P. W. D. Asam. Uh, I will have short introduction on him. Uh, Santanu Bhattacharya, additional chief engineer, mechanical, P. W. D. Asam. Uh, he is currently he currently serves as senior consultant to the public works department. He is pioneering by engineering in erosion control and waste management. He handles tasks related to environmental engineering and presently serves as the model officer for large wildlife friendly road project along uh, Kaziranga National Park of Assam. Now, now I would like to request Mr. Santanu Bhattacharya for his presentation, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Santanu, I'm Santanu Bhattacharya. I work with the government of Assam. Uh, and uh, we are designing, in fact, uh, we are working on a wildlife friendly road, very large wildlife friendly road along the Kajranga National Park. And uh, this is still in uh, DPR preparation stage. And uh, the alignment has uh, already been in, uh, approved. And um, this is a very sensitive project because it is, uh, it runs along the Kajranga National Park. And uh, if we go wrong, it may cause a disaster. So um, I'll try to give a small uh, presentation uh, in 20 minutes. So it will be difficult to bring everything in within the uh, slotted time. In fact, the alignment itself would have taken a half an hour. But anyway, I'll make it within uh, the allotted time of uh, 20 minutes. Let me share the presentation. This uh, Kajiranga National Park uh, is a biodiversity hotspot. It is also a um, um, UNESCO World Heritage Site. And uh, what Kajiranga offers in terms of variety and in terms of number is uh, very difficult to be found anywhere else. This is the, uh, uh, the topography of Kajiranga National Park. It starts from on the north. The north is down. Uh, down below is the north. It starts from the Brahmaputra River and it extends on the south to the hills of Karbi Anglong. And uh, the Kajiranga is basically, uh, it consists of wetlands and grasslands. And uh, you can see the yellow line is the existing National Highway 37. And uh, the wild animals need to cross to and fro. And especially this is more pronounced during the flood time, uh, June, July. And also while it comes back after the flood recedes, in uh, say November, October, November, it again is pronounced. And this uh, uh, yellow line, the National Highway, is uh, uh, acting as a big barrier for the wildlife of Kajiranga National Park. It is providing a huge barrier effect. There is, of course, habitation loss and fragmentation. Uh, there is degradation of habitat quality. It is quite usual and the direct loss of habitats during a clear, a clearing of vegetation due to the road, due to the road construction. And the biggest problem is uh, injury and mortality. Even a full grown adult, uh, Royal Bengal Tiger was killed some time back. This is a study done by Wildlife Institute of India. And, uh, you can see the number of road kill in 2019, in fact, and uh, the total number killed was 1176. And you, here you can see in June, July, August, during the flood time, the number of road kill is moved. And again, in October and November, from September it starts because the email starts to come back. Uh, as I said, the Kajinang offers something uh, which is not found in many places in terms of variety and, uh, uh, and number. And uh, as I told, uh, described about, uh, so this is the topography, the Kajinanga National Park from on the north, it starts from the Brahmaputra and extends up to the foothill of the Karbi Anglong Hills. And uh, the yellow line is the existing national highway and uh, uh, animals need to cross it, cross the national highway to and fro. 
and uh, throughout the year, in fact, the buttons is more pronounced during the flood and immediately after floods, when animals come back from the hills, again, back to the plains. And uh, this uh, uh, national highway is causing a big barrier effect. It has uh, caused habitat loss and fragmentation, degradation of habitat quality, the direct loss of habitats. And the biggest problem is the injury and mortality on, on the roads. You can see uh, even a full grown tiger was uh, killed with some time back. And uh, the number, it was uh, uh, a study was done by Wildlife Institute of India in 2019. The, here you can see the number of uh, animals killed is uh, 1176. And here you see in June, July, August, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, the number goes up. And again, uh, it uh, falls a little bit in September and again goes up because in September, October, and November, they come back from the hills after the flood recedes. And uh, the, here you can see even large animal, uh, 41 of them uh, were killed in 2019. And we tried to find out uh, the uh, black spots of accidents. It is again done by the Wildlife Institute of India. And the, we found that the entire stretch of the National Highway abutting the uh, Kajranga National Park is a black spot. Everywhere there are root keys. So uh, we need to provide a safe passage across the National Highway to maintain the integrity and sustainability of Kajranga National Park. And there's a pressing need for conservations to go hand in hand with uh, development. We want to uh, create a, a model project for uh, to be emulated elsewhere. Well, depending on the uh, intensity of animal corridor, the uh, park authority has identified nine corridors, nine animal corridors. And our aim is to uh, provide, make all the animal corridors wildlife friendly. And the, the fundamental of uh, designing is uh, this matrix. This is again Wildlife Institute of India matrix. And uh, Kajiranga National Park has everything from large carnivores, large herbivores, medium-sized mammals, small mammals, amphibians, reptiles, birds. And you can see on the left, that the base solution is maintaining natural habitat and minimizing human activity, but that's not possible. Already there is uh, anthropogenic activity along the national uh, highway. So the best, uh, next best option is to have something which is more green. You can see at the bottom. Uh, so uh, we are going basically for uh, animal underpasses and animal overpasses. So uh, we have the, the entire stretch is, uh, I'm, uh, is divided into three segments. The first segment itself is about 18.8 .8 kilometer, the first segment itself, and it will cover five animal corridors. Uh, we didn't, we, uh, Dr. Bilal, Bilal was also with us uh, at the very beginning, and we decided that instead of making individual animal underpass or overpass along the uh, animal corridors, but as they are closely spaced nearby, we decided to make one wildlife friendly road so that uh, the, we do not give the chance to uh, the animals to abandon what we do, to abandon the underpasses or abandon the overpasses. So we joined them together. Plus there's another aspect to it, the vertical clearance, as this is an uh, elephant landscape, we needed to give three times the height of a uh, uh, adult animal, uh, adult elephant rather, the vertical clearance should be three times. So that is a nine meter. We are going for nine meter vertical clearance that makes the top of the deck about 12 meter. So if we bring it down, the approaches will be about 500 meters this way and that way. So on either way, it will be about 500 meters. So that is a wastage. So we, we decided we joined them together. 
The second segment will be 11.3 kilometer, and uh, this will take care of uh, three animal corridors. And the last one will take care of a single corridor, was very uh, active corridor, and it will be about 4.770. And total length of these three segments uh, comes to 34.870 kilometers, so approximately 35 kilometers long. We faced a lot of challenges. The first challenge was, uh, uh, you know, we have to design it for universal need for uh, large herbivores like uh, elephant, rhino, Asiatic buffalo, to small herbivores like deers, carnivores like um, tigers, as well as reptiles and amphibians. The second was that it was imperative that the traffic is maintained smoothly during construction. Otherwise, the any traffic jam will prevent the animals to cross. Uh, and uh, the, it was mandated that uh, the alignment should be near the existing road itself so that another zone of disturbance is avoided. And the construction methodology should be quick and less disturbing to the eco-sensitive area. The end product must be acceptable to the wildlife, not only to human being, it has to be acceptable to the wildlife. And the biggest challenge we uh, faced during designing the alignment was uh, close proximity of the core area of Kaziranga National Park and Oil India pipelines. Oil India Limited has uh, uh, two pipelines going along. So we cannot encroach into the pipeline right of way also. So we decided that uh, we will avoid construction on the existing road. It will be along the existing road uh, to the extent possible. We'll go for uh, precast and prefab technology to the extent possible. If, even the piers will be precast, and uh, we'll, we'll, there will be no construction, no construction activity after sunset, because at night the animal movement is more pronounced. We will camouflage all immo immovable machinery at night. The small machineries will be withdrawn, and the bigger machineries, which cannot be withdrawn quickly, uh, will camouflage them at night. And uh, we have decided that the design will ensure, we will have to ensure that there is a minimum disturbance during operation also. But these are the salient features, the vertical. Uh, clearance is uh, nine meter, and uh, it will be a four lane one, uh, 22 meter wide four lane uh, structure, superstructure. This is the superstructure uh, deck config uh, configuration, and uh, we'll provide a vegetated noise barrier and headlight diffuser because headlight diffusion is uh, very important at night for wildlife. And uh, uh, we'll have deck lighting only, no mast lighting. There, uh, there are no light on the mast. It will be uh, on the decks. And we'll visit even the uh, piers under the deck so that uh, animal can take it to be a part of the nature, part of the landscape. Now, this will also give an ambience of a garden. It, it will be see, uh, in synergy with the, um, the surrounding and for the uh, drivers also, the road users also, they can give, they get a garden-like ambience. And uh, let me tell you, Kaziranga is the um, most important tourist place in the Northeast region. In fact, 83% of tourists coming into the Northeast visit uh, Kajiranga, which uh, it is two lakh plus per annum. And uh, uh, so our aim is to make it more attractive to the tourist also. It will have uh, uh, cut and fill tunnels at uh, locations where the topography demands. Again, these segments will be precast so that we can uh, move very fast. We propose to move about 12 meter per day. And uh, at two locations, uh, uh, we'll have, we propose to have tunnels, two inch, two inch tunnels. Uh, one one uh, tunnel will be very short, about 500 meter, and, and, and uh, the other one will be about 
1.5 kilometer will have twin tubes so that uh, in case of emergency the one can be used as an evacuation tunnel but uh, the, here is uh, because it is short uh, we have a problem here and because for short tunnels we cannot use uh, tunnel boring machines so we have to go for what is called uh, new austrian tunneling method this is kind of drilling uh, blasting and drilling so um, we'll have to convince the uh, Ministry of Environment and Forest also about the process. And uh, of course, we'll go for very controlled blasting. We'll be barricaded. It will be uh, surveillance, aerial surveillance will be there before blasting. And uh, let us see what uh, the MOEF re uh, responds to. And uh, in Kajiranga, there is a spot where every vehicle invariably stop to see the wild animals because you will see wild animal always throughout the day or night. You will see uh, wild animals. So over there, we'll uh, uh, provide uh, uh, car parking, public amenities, um, watch stars, and at this location, the uh, road will be six lane so that it can accommodate the vehicles for parking also. We'll have uh, uh, your cycle track and footpath on both sides. The cycling is very much needed now. And uh, uh, tourists do want to have cycle track. That locations, especially at bus stops, will give ramps for use of the uh, local people. Ramps will be very mild, one in 12, like hospitals, and uh, these will be used by uh, the local people. We'll provide the uh, road bridge for arboreal animals. In fact, uh, on the either side of the national highway, there are uh, two families of uh, Hulok Gibbon, the only ape in uh, India. And uh, as they cannot cross, because they, their locomotion is in hands, you know, they have started uh, in breeding. So uh, that is the serious issue. And uh, so we'll provide at two locations low bridges. We'll go for transplantation of trees to the extent possible instead of filling, or we'll uh, go for transplantation. And uh, this is the expected result. So this is perhaps uh, the biggest and the most comprehensive wildlife friendly road project. And it has huge ramification, as I told before that if we go wrong, it will perhaps kill Kajiranga once for all. But that is why we have to be very careful. And if it succeeds, and I'm sure it will, uh, the project will ensure preservation of Kajiranga landscape. It will present a very good example of coexistence of conservation and development to be emulated in projects through natural areas. And it will enhance tourist attraction and it will boost the tourism economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bhattacharya, for your informative presentation. Uh, from your presentation, we came to know that how Kaziranga National Park uh, have been uh, utilizing or say planning to uh, maintain the ecosystem and wildlife animal corridor uh, equally. Uh, you also talked about the construction methodology that should be used in the conservation area so that the construction will be eco-friendly or say, or say it will uh, much benefit to the ecosystem and the wildlife itself. Uh, ultimately, it will also boost the tourism sector. Uh, once again, thank you for your presentation. Uh, now we are, uh, we have one presentation remaining for this session. Uh, the presentation will be on the topics of cumulative impact assessment and case studies. Uh, presentation will be done by uh, Patricia. Uh, I would like to have such information or introduction about her. Uh, she is an inter environmental specialist, ESSA Technologies Limited. Patricia has over 15 years, years of experience in environmental assessment and management as part of the international consulting team, supporting ADB on TA 9461, Smart Infrastructure Planning and Design in Nepal. Patricia has focused on analyzing cumulative impacts of the upgrading of the Naranga Tetora Papaya Road to Wildlife. She also helped tremendously in the conduct of this training. Now I would like to request 
Ms. Patricia for the presentation, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Namaste. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this presentation, um, as uh, the introduction has mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, a topic that has come, come up in the previous presentations throughout this training because um, cumulative impacts is something that uh, when we are talking about multiple infrastructure, uh, multiple stressors, um, it is um, it is a consideration that, that needs to be to be taken into into account and in different presentations, but most notably Dr. Asha yesterday, she she kind of started to 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 discuss this topic. So I'm just going to um, give a bit more uh, an overview of um, cumulative impacts as they can be applied to, to infrastructure projects and especially in, in terms of uh, wildlife impacts and biodiversity protection. And I'm also going to share some details of um, how we have uh, applied um, a cumulative impact assessment to, to the, uh, the technical assistance we are um, doing for, for ABB for NHP Road. So I've structured uh, the presentation is, is brief. I was afraid to go over the, the 20 minutes, so uh, <laughs> I might be short now, but um, so there's three blocks. Um, why cumulative impacts are important, why we should consider them. Um, what's the state of practice and what are the approaches usually used to, to, to do this type of assessment? And then just talk about the, the example for, for, for MB and, and, and NHP road. Uh, why cumulative effects? Um, well, uh, this is a definition. There are many, but the, the, the key message is the same. So basically we are talking about changes to the environment caused by multiple actions. Um, uh, actions that are happening now that have manifested in the past and foreseeable in, in the future. Um, if we look at those, those are um, just a screenshots from, from article for, for news uh, for Nepal. So there's many stressors on, on wildlife. Uh, we, we hear about deforestation, uh, there's poaching, hunting, there's roads, uh, infrastructure development, uh, airports. Um, and mm, this can be addressed uh, individually at the project level through EIAs, um, but Cumulative impact wants to look at all the combination of these actions um, and the proposed development on the on the valued uh, environmental or social component. So that's uh, what the indication below refers. So yeah, we're looking at the the synergies, the, the additional effect of all these actions on on wildlife. Um, another reason why, specifically for, for wildlife impact assessments, cumulative impacts are, are important and are a necessary consideration is because um, infrastructure projects, roads, um, they are hundreds of kilometers, tens, so it, it's like a, it's large. Uh, and uh, the impact on, on, on wildlife, uh, it's also at the scale of the, the, the geographical range of these species. Um, so it's impacts that will happen typically over uh, large uh, territories and, and throughout uh, long periods of time. So that's why the, the, the cumulative impacts uh, lens, it's, it's important for that. Um, on this slide, I'm just um, highlighting, this is from a recent study that was looking at um, the cumulative risk from road development for, for apex predators. Um, the reason is that these species, because they, they are usually wide ranging, 
Um, they have low reproductive rates. They move a lot. They need uh, uh, connected landscapes. They need so they are most uh, vulnerable to to linear infrastructure development. And one of the conclusions of this study is that eight of the the 10 predator species most at, at risk are in Asia and also in, 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 in the south of, in the Terai region in Nepal. So for instance, the slot bear, uh, that was the, the, the species that got the highest uh, score in, in terms of uh, cumulative risk from, from road development. Um, tigers, um, dole. So, uh, in that study, uh, they were looking at potential impacts for from this for uh, the postal highway, and um, it's estimated that it, it, that infrastructure could impact seven of these um, predator species in just in Nepal. Um, the other reason why cumulative impacts are important is because uh, when talking about uh, upgrading roads or develop developing new roads, um, one of the common effects is that it induces development. Um, uh, people will settle along the roads, they will establish um, small businesses, it will, the increase in traffic will just generate more economic activity, um, land prices can go up, and that just triggers a dynamic of land use change and more development. Um, this map you see there is taken from, from the LISA study that uh, Rob discussed yesterday and is just to show how in um, some of uh, these plant linear infrastructures are actually overlapping um, protected areas and, and corridors. So just to indicate that uh, this impact of induced development, uh, when it's happening in, on um, areas of high biodiversity value can be uh, especially damaging. Um, another reason why uh, cumulative impacts can provide something that it's not, um, Mm, it will not. We will not get from individual project uh, EIAs is uh, the conservation um, of wildlife. So this is not done at the project level, or it's done at the landscape level. Uh, the reality is that for, especially for wide ranges species, you will have a meta population that it's in a territory. So you have source populations, you have corridors. Um, they use habitats, they have seasonal movements. They, so if we only look at the project and, and that's it, um, we are missing other uh, stressors that might be happening in the landscape that this species is, uh, is effectively using. Uh, and this is just a, an example of this strategy for for conservation in, in the Tal region, um, that it's, it is at the landscape level. And, and, and the, the other map shows just, yeah, the importance of, of the Varandavar corridor, that it's connecting the, the, the hills uh, with uh, Terai and even like, for, for, for instance, for, for tigers, they, they also, they go to Valkini Reserve. So it, it's actually, it, it's the, the scale, is, it's, it's really larger than, than the one project. In terms of approaches for, for cumulative assessment and, and, and what's the, the, the practice, um, one thing, to keep in mind is that um, in terms of the logic of the process and, and the, the tools used is not much, is not really very different from the project center EIA. Um, what changes is the perspective. So in this figure I'm showing on, on the left, you have the typical EIA uh, done for a project uh, where 
that's like the, the, the center of the assessment. The project will cause different impacts and those will impact the, the, the receptors, the, the, the components of the environment. But when we are doing a cumulative impact assessment, we reverse. So the center is, is the, the, the valued environmental component. For instance, in, in that case, it could be looking at, at, at a species level as a type to a tiger. And then, so besides road development, what other actions, what other stressors, stressors are impacting this, um, this species? So that's, that's the, the, the difference um, in terms of approach. Um, in practice and, and in, in Nepal, if we look at Nepal, because there's no regulatory requirement for conducting cumulative impact studies as part of the um, project um, development and, and, and approval, um, it, well, it's not done at that level, but however, there are some examples. And so I'm just highlighting this um, assessment that was done in 2016 for, for um, the impacts of multiple types of infrastructure. It was not just roads, it was uh, hydropower, um, uh, mining, uh, et cetera, for a, a snow leopard. In the, so it, it's an interesting example. And, and I think it's, uh, it's gaining um, attention and, and importance, this type of assessment. So I'm just highlighting another article where they were looking at um, the, the impacts on habitat quality from uh, the impacts of this, again, these multiple infrastructures that are planned for, for the southern part of the country and how that could impact uh, habitat quality. Um, so, so it's interesting to see that there's, I, I think from both like academia and, and, and conservation organizations and, and, and also from practitioners, this recognition that um, th there needs to be this type of um, uh, assessment upstream before EIAs of, of the projects. Uh, going a bit broadly in, in, in Asia, uh, I found in my, in my research that there's, there's limited guidance in terms of approaches and methods. Um, I found that uh, that was done for migratory species, migratory mammals in, in Central Asia that has some, um, some orientation on potential assessment methods uh, and, and it's useful. Of course, there's the, the recent study again from, from the Rob and, and, and colleagues from USAID. Um, and, and I think again, like this is gaining attention and, and traction because there is in Asia currently there's like a rapid infrastructure development and in many countries, in many regions, that overlaps areas with, with high biodiversity values, with protected areas. Um, and, and then you have, like, as we were um, seeing in, in the different presentations, it's really, this is connected, it goes beyond the, the, the boundaries of a country, right? Like, so the landscapes are are really international and, and transnational and you, and you have these um, ecological corridors connecting uh, very important conservation areas in, in, in the region. So again, just like a few examples of uh, studies and, and papers that uh, have been looking at, at considerations of multiple infrastructure development on, on wildlife in Asia. Um, internationally, there has been more work done in, in, in the past, I think, compared to, to Asia. So there's the literature there is a bit more established. Um, the problem is that it, most of the, the cases and, and the studies that have been done are from like temperate um, regions and, and, and wildlife species from this region. So yeah, most notably um, North American and Europe. And uh, I'm just giving an, an example of uh, that map. Um, 
using that's for an assessment of um, cumulative impacts from road development to, to reindeer in, in northern Europe. Um, so spatial indicators and um, trying to assess the disturbance and the, the stressors come up with a special indicator that it's, a, it's one of the very common approaches. Mm, I'm also <clears throat> highlighting this guidance from, from IFC because it's a, it's, it really has become kind of the, the reference framework for when conducting um, cumulative impact assessment according to, to international standards. And, and we have uh, based our approach and methodology very much on, 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 on this framework, the, the steps that are outlined in this guidance. So, yeah, going into to the third part of the presentation. So we we have um, as part of um, technical uh, assistance to to ADB for for NHP. So Narangayat, um, Etalda, Patlaya Road. Uh, the, the key, the core of the the technical assistance was was the ecological assessment that. Um, um, my colleagues uh, Clara and, and Ben and, and, and Gordon talk about uh, yesterday and, and the previous day. But there's uh, another component, which is uh, the cumulative impact. So we are looking at how the, the upgrading of the road, so going from two lanes to four lanes, plus other infrastructure that it's already there. There are secondary roads, there's um, transmission line projects that have already been um, implemented, pipelines, and there's also um, different plan linear infrastructure, um, the east-west highway, uh, the, no, sorry, the, east, the, the train line, the east-west, um, the, the fast track uh, highway to the east. So, yeah, it's like our goal was to see how those different infrastructure projects and, and multiple stressors in these road corridors are affecting wildlife. So we focus on, on, on wildlife and terrestrial wildlife. And so the approach we've followed, um, there's... A, on, on one hand, we based on the, the biodiversity baseline survey that was done for, for the NHP road. Um, another information we have from previous impact assessment, a literature list of species um, of known occurrence in, in this area. So we combine all that information. We came with a long list of uh, species, wildlife species, and, and then we select uh, the, the priority components for, 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 the, for the cumulative impact assessment. And then on the other hand, we look at the, the road corridors, uh, try to get, uh, well, as much as possible is spatial information about the, the other infrastructure projects, the other roads, um, the stressors, the, 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 the location of the settlements. Um, also, like uh, we were um, coming up with um, spatial indicators of, of the level of disturbance, of, of pressure on, on the natural habitats and the forests. So, for instance, like road density for the different forest patches. Um, and we've combined all that information into a conceptual model. So for each uh, priority species, um, for each priority deck, we have developed, um, which I, I will show you just in a minute, um, uh, impact pathways diagrams. And so which this, these diagrams represent our understanding of what are going, what the, the, the impact pathways that affecting these species are. Um, and this is uh, um, uh, also complemented with, with literature review. Uh, we, we have research like 
the incidence of roadkill for these different species, how affected they are by, um, for instance, uh, edge effect, or if in climate change, how, how vulnerable they are to climate change. So all this information from the literature, um, especially information we have from, from other projects or EIAs has been um, synthesized into these uh, conceptual maps. And, and there we have, based on those diagrams, we have identified indicators to uh, aggregate uh, the, the, these uh, stressors, these pressures on, on the VEX and come up with, uh, for each VEX, an overall estimation of, of the level of cumulative impact. And based on those results, uh, uh, we are proposing some mitigation measures and, and monitoring, which are very aligned with um, the results of the NHP um, ecological assessment. Uh, and it, it can be like complementary measures. It's not so much uh, adding another passage structure, but looking at this interaction, these pressures, and perhaps, uh, for instance, a, a measure could be enriching uh, with vegetation, road sites, or, or the, the, the established passages for wildlife. So wildlife use that more instead of going uh, into um, uh, settlement areas or agricultural areas where human wildlife conflict is another of the stressors and, and one of the, 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 the considerations in, in, in this social environmental system of, of the road corridor. So for, for the selection of the priority species, the priority uh, VEX, um, we looked at functional groups. Uh, these are um, species groups that will interact in a similar way with the road. So for instance, we, we have wide ranging carnivores and in that group, you will have tigers, uh, leopards, uh, hyena. So these are species because of their ecology, uh, their behavior, their movement patterns, they are going to have a similar vulnerability to, 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 the, to the road and, and are going to, to have similar impacts. So we came up with these four large groups and for each group, we identified representative species. Uh, to identify those species, we use criteria. Uh, so we look at the conservation status of the, the species, obviously the, the endangered species, iconic species, that uh, it's, it's an important consideration but also the, the ecological importance of the species or if they represent, um, how representative they are of the ecosystems as well, like the keystone species. So there are species that might not have this um, protection status, but they, because of uh, their role, they, they, mm, they perform in the ecosystem, perhaps they, they spread seeds or they, they, they are an important prey species. Um, so that, that was another consideration. And then also the vulnerability to, to, to road impacts. So yeah, that's the, we include that information in, in an Excel file and that's how we, we prioritize and tabulated all, all that information. And this is uh, one example of these impact pathways uh, diagrams I was just talking before. Uh, so the idea is to <clears throat> represent what are the main impact pathways that are going to affect these species. Coming from the road project, but also, and those are the, the, the yellow um, boxes there, uh, there are other uh, stressors that might affect one of these pathways. Um, so if, for instance, in this case, uh, we can think of uh, uh, rhinoceros and, and the increased mortality that might come from, from, from the road and from increased traffic, but 
can, can also come from, from poaching, from uh, retaliation, killing, because uh, they, they get into human wildlife um, conflicts. They get, so just like a way to articulate what are the likely uh, impact uh, pathways that are uh, affecting these, these species. Um, in terms of uh, takeaways, so we are finalizing this, this study. Um, it's going to be part of the, the broader ecological assessment for, for the NHP road. Um, one of the considerations is that it is, uh, and, and I think uh, Karma pointed to this in, in her introduction, uh, this um, type of uh, cumulative or more strategic assessments are probably best uh, applied or used uh, upstream. So before doing the, the environmental impact assessment for, for an individual project, um, you can look at the, 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 the landscape, you can look at the, the, what different uh, infrastructure projects are proposed for the region. Um, that's probably an easier way to, to implement this than when it's done as part of the, the EIA of, of the project itself. Um, engagement with a stakeholder is key. We were limited in, in that respect because, um, well, the, the, the COVID uh, situation and, um, but uh, for a thorough uh, cumulative impact assessment, uh, talking with the, with the different institutions and, and getting that coordination is, is, is critical. Uh, another consideration is in terms of the information and, and for the indicators. Um, in, in the literature, there's some associations, for instance, like uh, road density uh, thresholds. So, beyond this level of road density in an area, that species could be significantly impacted. Um, so the, the challenge with that or the difficulty is that most of those uh, species specific information or thresholds uh, has not been developed for, for species in, in Nepal or, or in Asia, it's more for um, Northern Europe or, or North America species. So although the, the, uh, the research is, is moving in that direction, but sometimes it's, it's difficult to, to find those, those thresholds uh, that can, can inform the, when the sustainability of, of the, the species or of the component has been compromised. Um, and in general, yes, data and, and baseline information. Mm, even there's some, uh, it, it tends to, there, there tends to be more information perhaps at, at a coarser um, a spatial scale and, and not uh, so much when you try to, to, to bring the, the CIA to, to, the, to the project area or the project scale. Um, it tends to, to, to be perhaps too high level to, to provide more actionable information for, for, for mitigation and, and monitoring. And that's, that's it for, for me. Thank you, Patricia, uh, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, by this presentation, we come to an end for this session, for the first session of three presentation. Uh, regarding these three presentation, if you have any queries related to the presentation, uh, the floor is open to you. Uh, the virtual participants can have the uh, questions in chat box. So if you have any queries related to this presentation, please, the floor is open. Can I ask a question? while people are thinking. 
So just for Patricia, uh, thank you, Patricia, uh, for your uh, very comprehensive presentation. Um, I was just uh, curious, in one of your slides, you had shown that um, there is a lot of um, experience and examples of cumulative impact assessment done in Europe. So, uh, and of course, it is a requirement for ADB projects and, you know, IFC, and you had referred to the IFC guidelines, but uh, as we learned over the course of yesterday and the day before that, actually, we are still not doing a good job at all in this aspect on cumulative impact assessment, at least in our projects in Asia. So, uh, I was wondering, um, I hope this question is not too difficult. With your experience and knowledge from the cumulative impact assessment that is conducted for projects in Europe, and if we were to do it really properly in our projects in Asia, like what does it mean in terms of additional work or additional time or additional resources? Um, I know it's important, but then the thing is we're not doing it properly. So I just wanted to understand the, the extent of additional uh, time and resources that would be required. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Karma. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a difficult question, so I'll, I'll try my best. Uh, um, I think uh, one, so this is something that I don't think it's only in Asia, for instance, in my, in, in general, in my professional experience, when I have done um, or revised a, a cumulative impact assessment that it's done for, for a project because it, it needs to meet um, international standards or uh, so I think one of the problems is that if it's not part of the regulatory requirements of, of the country usually there's there's no scoping done or no understanding of um, what the, for instance, the key components that should be considered, what are going to be the main issues. So I think if, um, if when this is done at the project level, if there was a prior work in which there, there has been some sort of strategic scoping or there's some guidance or, or it's, in, yeah, I think that will be very helpful to, to direct um, the practitioners that are doing the, the EIA to the main issues and, and, and the main values, for instance, or um, so I'm not really sure how that can be implemented if, uh, um, if there has to be yeah, some, some kind of like a broader the scope assessment, sectorial, strategic. And, but th if that somehow at, at done at a high level, but identifying the key issues, what, what are the VEX, and then it's uh, that somehow sets the framework for, for the EIA at the project level. Um, so I, I think that could help have some kind of upstream assessment or, or yeah, framework that. Yes, thank you, Patricia. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Patricia, for your uh, comprehensive presentations. Yeah, I uh, heard in your presentation, there is no, uh, you know, cumulative impact assessment, uh, regulatory requirement in Nepal. Yeah? Uh, uh, you know, there is uh, EIA, uh, you know, this is the provision uh, in, the, in the Environment Protection Act. And in the process of the uh, conducting EIA, there are, there are a number of steps, okay, scoping ITUR, the preliminary steps to be carried out. And the consultant, the expert, you know, uh, has the right to define the scope and the uh, making the TUR. Yeah, and the, the, this shall be endorsed by the consultant ministry. Uh, that means uh, we can say, can we say there is a regu regulatory arrangement? Uh, can you include the scope you, 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 you want in the, in the uh, concerned issues under the study? Right. So if I understood correctly, and you were asking Sushil, uh, Mr. Sushil, that if there's, if 
this is coping, it, it's already happening as part of the regulatory requirements or the common practice in, in Nepal. Um, so before, before doing uh, the EIA or, or the IEE, there, there's some um, scoping, some information exchange between the practitioners, uh, the consulting that is going to do the study and, and the, the ministry or the government um, in charge of. So I think that could be probably a space to, to include those considerations perhaps uh, as part of the scoping. So if there's, um, before getting into to the work of, of doing the impact assessment, if, if there's some guidance from, from the government, from the ministry, um, I could see very well that as an entry point of um, including this cumulative impact pers perspective, yeah. Yeah, Patricia, actually, uh, why I'm asking this question, you know, there are piles of, uh, you know, uh, policies and regulations in Nepal, you know, so, so I think the num adding number of policies and the number of guidelines will not, uh, you know, I think so, so, uh, so effective, yeah, but we have to uh, focus how to use the available policies and documents. Right. That is the concern. Thank you. Yes. Actually, Patricia, if I may come in and supplement to what uh, Pirisa said, um, it, it is related with the two issues. First is uh, regarding the legal requirement. Uh, like Pirisa said, uh, the new um, Environmental Protection Act uh, 2019 and the Regulation 2020 has covered uh, the cumulative impact, the requirement for cumulative impact assessment as well. But by saying that, yes, this is an area which is actually evolving. And um, uh, not exactly in, in every uh, environmental impact assessment or IE, we consider cumulative impact assessment, number one. Number two, if we do, it is still, I mean, the question is on procedure, on the extent that is uh, required as par uh, to international standards. So these issues are there, but uh, if these are uh, projects that is uh, supported by uh, development partners, generally the international best practices are followed. But then uh, if it is uh, something funded by government themselves, um, yes, there, there, there are uh, ample room to uh, improve uh, uh, in actually conducting the cumulative impact assessment in a, in a more uh, required and procedural manner. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, it's not, the practice is evolving and because uh, yeah, the, the, the needs and the, the development context is continuously changing. So that's, yeah. Yeah. And um, more importantly, like uh, this uh, NSP project, this is going to be one of the icon uh, for uh, assessing cumulative impact assessment because a lot of thing is going to happen in this corridor. The Baranavar and uh, up to Parsa, uh, the road, uh, the international airport, transmission line, everything, the railways, everything will be, uh, you know, so sort of, so, so this, this is going to be a very, interesting uh, area where uh, providing the cumulative impact assessment will uh, really uh, come into. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Dr. Smolzun has raised his hands. Please, I would like to request him to have his question. Thank you, Sovaji. Uh, very good, afternoon. good morning, Patricia. Thank you for your comprehensive presentation. I have just minor two queries uh, that uh, in one slide, I saw that uh, uh, the region uh, you have used uh, as East-West Highway and the Mahendra Highway, two different concepts. Uh, but in uh, our context, the, those two highway is the same one. Uh, now it is uh, called as East-West East Highway. So uh, you may some you may correct uh, that uh, legend. Mm -hmm. And another my qu uh, query is. Uh, uh, that uh, because of the postal highway, there it may impact uh, major seven apex uh, predators in Nepal uh, that uh, I saw in one slide. Then uh, what is the methodology you adopted uh, for this data? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. So it's, yeah, thanks. And now I will correct. Yes, it's the, it's the same uh, highway, the Mahendran is West Highway. So the, um, the, that comment of the, the study you referred, the one that 
it's uh, it's a reference. It's a really recent study, just uh, from from two thousand twenty two, from this year. Um, so I I will forward to you, or or I will share with with uh, the the group. Um, so it's. Uh, it's from the. I identify that through through the literature review. What I mean is that I I, I didn't do that that study, um, but I I think they used um, they used a, a, an approach in which they were um, on on one side identifying uh, the the species that will be impacted by by this road and infrastructure development because of the, where their habitats are. So it was like a special assessment. And then they were considering as well the vulnerability of the, the species. And as a proxy for that, uh, I think but I'm, I'm talking from, from memory, so don't, don't take me <laughs> the details to, to but I, the, the the average, the size, so the the, the mass, the, the average mass of the species. So, uh, with the assumption that larger species are more impacted by by infrastructure development that, than a smaller smaller size species. Um, so it was like, a, it, to me, it, it was like a um, relatively simple um, a spatial analysis um, that can be done for yeah at, at regional level um but yeah it, it was through a special indicators looking at the the exposure of of these species to to the to the highways and the vulnerability of of the species i will share the the article with, with you uh, there is another hazard uh, Henry's from netra sarmasan uh, i would like to request him to put his question the concerned presenter, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sua, madam And thank you, uh, Patricia, for your excellent presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, thank yes, you. Yes, I can, Mr. Netra. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And uh, I really, um, I would like to add uh, one additional point on the point yes, that... there? yes, can you hear me? OK, let, let, let us give him some time. There, there is another um, uh, question raised by uh, our uh, here. Uh, people here. Uh, we can hear. Uh, first, first question from. Hello, Hello. 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 Virtual participants Hello. can hear Hello. Netraji. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, I, Patricia, for your presentation. Just I, want, uh, I have one query that in CI, in Nepal, we have uh, there are different <clears throat> organization carry different development projects. The development projects start from different periods. They will not start at the same time. Before con construction any projects, we have to carry out PIO or CI or environment study. But uh, in case of CI, we will carry the, the, uh, the environment study because the projects will not start at the same time or, or the uh, <clears throat> developers are also different. So how they will carry the CI will be at the cost of the CIA, or if, if there is any one single organization, uh, then it will be easy to carry out the CIA. Every time if there is added as other projects, we have to carry out the CIA or not. Is there any uh, such kinds of uh, guidelines in other countries or can you elaborate on this aspect? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that, that's a really good question. And I think when when doing CIA, um, usually we are look, looking at effects more in, in the longer term compared to, to uh, project, um, individual project EIA. And um, so I think that the, the overall guidance is that you should include in your assessment um, reasonably foreseen uh, projects or, or actions. Um, that meaning that, of course, there's a level of uncertainty because if um, some, for instance, if you are looking at um, a region where um, different um, infrastructure are being proposed, but they might not 
the perhaps they are in the pre-feasibility phase they have not been approved but they are so it, it will be justified to include that even if not all the projects come to completion um, but keeping in mind that so there is that uncertainty level and and then as well one of the the, the ways to 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 mitigate or to work with this um, this uncertainty and, and this nature of the evolving nature of development that you, you might have next year more pro development proposals of the same type or all the different projects um, so it's to work so you do your assessment for 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 a time horizon that makes sense for for the cumulative impact so for instance for for wildlife if um if you are looking at the potential effects of these different developments of of roads and infrastructure usually those projects are part of a development strategy or a sector sectoral strategy and those plans have like dates like so for instance by 2050 the road network is going to be expanded to so that will be also like a, a good guidance to to fix that time horizon and see like by this time if all these projects are implemented and that those could be the impacts of uh, but but yes like it's it's I, I think like a general comment is that there's no one single recommended method and, and approach. It's um, there's more uncertainty that with uh, project level impact assessment. And I think as, as long as those uncertainties or those assumptions about development about are, are well justified and, and uh, documented, um, it is uh, it is reasonable or it's it's good practice to 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 make those assumptions and and yeah and, and usually work towards like longer periods of time that than the project level. Uh, Patricia, if I may uh, supplement to your uh, uh, answer, um, uh, actually uh, discriminative impact assessment is needed and has to be done by every project. Now the question is uh, very rightfully uh, Sankar Bhavisar has raised. Um, are, are the projects are going to do the same thing repeatedly from where the cost will uh, be, be born? So the answer is like, um, it, it is unfortunate that in our part of the world, uh, database uh, information and all these things are not readily available and accessible to the public. Actually, if that uh, could have been done, um, and then in that case, every new project will just check here's the zone of influence. And if the zone of influence of uh, other uh, ongoing, existing, or planned in future uh, projects are coinciding, then they have to uh, you know, consider uh, the, those impacts and conduct, uh, and that is called uh, the cumulative impact assessment. So uh, had there been this database readily available, then a lot of information is already there at your hand. And you, need, you only need to retrofit with the information regarding your project and try to identify what are the impacts and what could be the mitigation measure. So, so the, this is one small supplement uh, I just wanted yeah. to Yeah. Thank you. Mm, yes, totally agree. Yeah. Deepak, sir, yeah. There is another question from Padam, sir, from WWF. Actually, it's uh, just to supplement on uh, Deepak, sir, and, and uh, Sushil, sir's point. Um, CIA cumulative um, impact assessment provision is there in the EPA already means that that is really excellent um, start for us to think about it. Yes, definitely we agree. There is no elaborated guideline how to accomplish it. You no, know? so I think our practices, if we start something beautiful, then definitely result will be good. So let's think, think from that uh, point of view and appreciate to the government of Nepal and and, and let's start if whatever scope now allows us to work and think about the CIA, let's say start that. That could be one starting point for us. That is supplement to Sushil sir and also Deepak sir's point. And another point that is important for cumulative impact assessment that Deepak sir just highlighted is that who having information, who is planning, what activities are going in, in that particular area that we want to have no cumulative.
uh, we are we are going back to Netraji now. Um, oh, but uh, Padamji was asking like, um, uh, how are you going to integrate EIA, CIA, and BBA? Um, are these uh, really needed to do differently, or um, is it is it one exercise uh, in which uh, these different assessments contribute to each other? So that was the question from Padamji. If I yeah, 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 you are right. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a really, yeah, that's, a, mm, it, it's a complex, it's a difficult question. So uh, I think probably in the discussion this afternoon, we'll, hopefully we have um, an opportunity. I think in some of the groups, there's one more mm, related to, to practitioners and, and practicing um, because I, I, I think it, without getting into much detail, it, it's true that there's, although it's pointing to the same goal of understanding the impacts and, 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 and including effective mitigation in, into project development, but those are slightly different tools. So um, I don't know if a potential solution will be to have some guidelines uh, in terms of at least, well, in terms, for instance, how to integrate um, biodiversity baseline assessments that inform um, the impact assessment and inform as well as CIA. And, and I think uh, along the lines of the comment from, from Deepak G in terms of like, perhaps not all the projects have to go through uh, or com complete a full CIA. Um, uh, if there's some way in which through this uh, scoping phase that precedes the, the impact assessment, if the development is not uh, in an area where it's going to be close to um, a component that a valued component or because of the magnitude or, or the, the size of the, of the project. So I think, yeah, there, there needs to be guidelines, not, not just in providing advice on how to do this type of assessments, but also like in, in a way to discard or, or orient practitioners where you don't need to go in, in, into, into that detail. So somehow like a filtering a bit the, the, the practice, but, but yes, I think it's, a, it, it's complex not to, to articulate a solution that <laughs> applies to, to all projects. And so just a quick uh, addition to what uh, Patricia said. Um, actually, uh, EIA is the umbrella. And then uh, all these uh, different studies like uh, BBA, we call it BBA, you call it CIA, you call it... Uh, hydrometeorological study, you call it air water noise monitoring, physical uh, you know, topographic and geological dimensions, demographic, all these contribute to EIA. Now, whether we are going to do BBA or not depends on the site. Like if you are building something in uh, Chitwan Nahu Park, then you have to do, do a BBA because CHA is attracted. But if we are doing, doing something in uh, a, a, a pretty, like uh, the same, um, uh, some, some road uh, after, uh, you know, um, let us say uh, from uh, Nanga to, uh, to, to uh, somewhere like if, if, it, if it does not attract uh, such critical biodiversity or a sort of thing, then probably a simple assessment uh, could do. But then if it is something like National Park, you have to do CHA. Similarly, for cumulative impact assessment, um, uh, if uh, you, are, you are building a hydropower uh, reservoir project and then there are a lot of other in the city, then you have to do CHA. But if uh, it, it is something like a small water supply project, Again, cumulative impact assessment may not be required. So it, it all depends on project. And I know Palam Sir knows better than us. So <laughs> this is a like, uh, it's covered by the yeah. Everything is covered by the yeah. What? Everything is covered by the by the yeah. So then we do it. Yeah. Okay. So then. Yeah, yes, you are right. So these are the tools do which support the supplement the EIA. Yeah, yeah. Then yeah. Uh, what about the uh, CIA. So that is that supplement the EIA or EIA supplement the uh, CIA? No, so, CIA supplement CIA because CIA is an assessment which is done considering all the different type and uh, the professional attributes of the project. And then these are combined and we'll see what will the impact the project will add to the existing impact scenario. 
And Great. then we have to do that mitigation measure. So that mitigation measure is suggested by EIA. So it is uh, a CIA is part of EIA. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, let's get back to Mr. Sarma sir. Mr. please. Just to add one small thing, small thing only just for CIA type of thing, we need some coordinating agency at the center level who has more information like National Planning Commission. Can we strengthen their capacity to work on these issues? Could be one best solution for us to consider because all sectoral ministries do have you know, their sectoral you know, priorities and plans and active actions plan. So there is no coordinating agency involved in this today's uh, this training session. So we actually feeling having that gap here. So could be uh, we may need to work with the National Planning Commission uh, to uh, provide us the coordination services on this type of issues so that cumulative uh, cumulative impact assessment type of things will be easier for us to plan and, and execute over. Yes, I, I think I got uh, most of it and, and I agree. I think um, Netra sir was um, talking about the need for some government agency to have like a central role, like a, a planning cent central role where um, yeah, they, they can um, provide that the guidelines or the orientation or act as this uh, what we were discussing before, like uh, um, discern when when there is a, a, a development proposal, if if there's a need for for a BBA, those considerations that the, the Deepak sir was just uh, mentioning, right? Like. A, if the, the project is located close to, to a protected area, to a national park, then that somehow will trigger the, the need for, for, the, for a BBA, for, for a cumulative impact. So, but um, yeah, sometimes it's uh, the, also the, because of the nature of the development, if you have linear infrastructure, railway roads, um, um, <clears throat> electric lines, it's also like different uh, government ministries and departments that are take care of, of those sectors. So having like a, some entity that can coordinate that information exchange or, or can, I think it's, it, it's a good idea. Thank you everyone. Uh, we are at the end of our, this session. Uh, there is one question in the chat box. It seems it, it is related to it. Uh, Bilal sir presentation. Uh, he is not uh, between us, so we may uh, convey this question to his email, and we will get back to it. I think so. Yeah. So this is uh, the second uh, session for today. Uh, we have two presentations: one by uh, Mr. Karma Chogyal and uh, another by Kim Bonnie. Bonai. Um, the first presentation uh, will be uh, a case study again. Uh, the, the beauty of uh, today's session is uh, like yesterday in day one and day two, we were basically uh, uh, working more on uh, uh, theoretical uh, part of uh, you know, uh, uh, the subject matter. Um, we were also sharing experience, but still, I mean, today uh, we are more uh, looking at the more applied um, existing and experience, in experience uh, cases uh, through through the case studies. Um, the morning presentations were excellent. Um, now um, uh, we are going for another case study in uh, Bhutan, um, our neighboring country. Um, uh, this is on uh, monitoring and performance evaluation case study of the Bhutan Road Network Project 2. Um, the, the presentation will be made by uh, Mr. Karma Chogyal. Um, uh, Karma ji uh, leads an environment uh, consultancy in uh, Bhutan. Um, he used to work uh, uh, for the National Environment Commission of Bhutan in the past, eventually completing a master's degree in geoinformation science and uh, earth observation. Um, over the years, um, uh, Karmaji supported uh, several ADB projects. Um, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, we are working together uh, in Bhutan. One of them uh, on the monitoring of wildlife used by underpasses, use of underpasses through the road network uh, project in southern Bhutan. Um, this was um, uh, supposed to be the first uh, such uh, wildlife uh, friendly uh, infrastructure and uh, underpass used in Bhutan. So with this, um, uh, Karmaji, um, uh, I'm handing over uh, the presentation to you and we look forward for your very insightful and interesting presentation. Please, over to you. Very good morning to 
all those part participants, the experts from Nepal, and uh, the good afternoon to those uh, parts, those actually experts and the AD representative from the Asian Development Bank in Philippines, and our friends, all the participants from the uh, the Western Hemisphere. Good evening. So today, uh, welcome. Today I'll be presenting the uh, case study from Bhutan, uh, Southern Bhutan. So underpass camera monitoring case study. So the study was basically uh, carried out by three individuals, Karma Chuval, that's me, and Norris Dot, uh, international expert, particularly expert on wildlife uh, tracking with the use of cameras, infrared cameras, and Karma Yangzum, who is the uh, ADB's safeguard specialist, uh, she has been instrumental in uh, devising and assisting us in getting this uh, uh, study done. So the study was uh, funded by Asian Development Bank and is still being funded by Asian Development, uh, Development Bank. The, let me uh, give you a brief, brief background of the, the project, why it's so important and uh, and how we proposed those underpasses to be, I mean, the, how the underpasses were proposed and constructed under this road network project. The road network project uh, was supported financially by, by ADB, constructed around 183 kilometers of highways and feed roads, particularly along the southern uh, borders, bordering Indian uh, region. If you look at the map, uh, the first map, uh, you can see that uh, we don't have lateral highways along the southern border. We have the lateral route from the northern central part from east to west. If we have to move through uh, the from the east to the west or west, vice versa, along the southern boundary, then we have to go through India. So that's why the, uh, the government of Bhutan requested Asian Development Bank to finance and support the construction of the uh, RN road network project too. Under Red Road Network Project 2, five segments of road uh, highways were constructed. So which actually we abbreviated as NH, National Highway 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Of the five, you can see two of these highways, NH2 and NH5, actually falls under the wildlife habitat, particularly the Asian elephant habitat. In the second map, you can see the uh, NH2 and NH5 actually lies perfectly on the elephant habitat map. And the red area here represents elephant habitat, which actually borders with the Indian plain. So we can see the, this is, these are foothills and, and a vital habitat for Asian elephant, particularly elephants that reside within Bhutan and goes, I mean, back and forth from India to Bhutan. So under this, the Road Network Project uh, study, uh, it was envisaged that having this road constructed in this sensitive habitat would result in uh, habitat destruction, fragmentation, even act as barrier for free movement of elephants, particularly for elephants. So uh, having known these problems, the Department of Road, Bhutan's uh, Road Construction Agency, then considered a mitigation measure, the construction of first underpasses in Bhutan, to minimize the impact, particularly the very effect of the roads. The underpasses were basically the oversize, oversizing of cross drainages using prefabricated metal, particularly in Bhutan, we use this because it's uh, being remote, uh, building bridges cost, uh, huge bridges cost huge amount of money, plus again, it's time consuming. So, and a different uh, mode of construction was, different technology was uh, adopted, particularly for this, to uh, have the drainage structure as well as underpasses combined together. So where did we, uh, where was, where were these uh, underpasses constructed? Underpasses were, uh, the, as per the study uh, conducted under the ADB, uh, ADB's RNP2 project, it was known that along these foothills, particularly co close, closer to the Indian plains, the elephants were using the uh, rivers and stream corridors to, for the movement upstream and back to the Indian plains, into the foothills, 
in search of water holes, permanent water holes, water holes mineral, uh, mineral uh, salt lakes, even finding mates. So they were moving, they were moving up and down, particularly along the, uh, what do you say, the rivers and stream corridors. And those on the day, and the uh, underpasses were constructed on those, uh, those uh, rivers and stream uh, corridors. So under the NH2, we have constructed, uh, the uh, ADB has, const uh, ADB funded a construction of seven underpasses and one underpass on the NH5. So you can see on NH5, a part of the road actually passes through the wildlife sanctuary. Uh, and then we propose only one left underpass in uh, under the NH5. So having constructed uh, this underpass, so it was very important for the ADB and for the department roads and for others to see whether those underpasses were being used by Asian elephant or it's just, just a showcase or never being used. So in order to understand the usage and their effectivity or effectiveness or efficacy, so we have, uh, we have conducted a pilot study in from 2015, 2017. And then from up then a follow-up study, again, aimed for two years of study from 2019, 2000, but we could not complete the second part because of the COVID uh, restrictions. However, under the pilot studies, our aim was, no, overall aim was to see a uh, fine the underpass usage and their effectiveness. So for this, we have um, monitored four large underpasses. Three at, when we, when we say large underpasses, in, in Bhutan's context, it is large, but by the international standard, maybe even by the Indian standard, our underpasses could be small, actually, medium to small. But in, in, in other parts of the world, particularly India, maybe in China or even in Nepal, the underpasses could be bigger than this. There are huge underpasses I've seen somewhere in the Assam. It's quite huge, wide, open. But for us, within our budgetary limit, so the, these were recommended and constructed at, in those uh, in, in, in RNP2 uh, project. So, and we wanted to find out whether these structures were effective or, it, and if, if it was used or not. So four large underpasses for in Bhutan's context. So how large were they? The average dimension that we have provided here is 8.6 meter wide, 7.3 meter high, uh, and 9.9 .9 meter long. Actually 9.9 .9 meter is average road width. So average openness was 5.5. .5. And we found out that even during the construction, these underpasses were used. So you can see elephants were, elephants were using these underpasses readily and regularly. And we carried out a follow-up monitoring study. Again, we aim to do for two years with the ADBs, uh, wanted to extend it for two years of an extensive study. And this time we included even a smaller underpasses, different sizes of underpasses in the, while I say we just included three on the NH2 and one on the NH5, but on uh, in, in the follow-up study, we included the smaller ones. We had the smallest one with the openness ratio of just 1.39. It's very small, actually, very narrow and small. And we had a medium one to small one, which openness ratio of 2.9. And we studied, uh, we uh, included these underpasses to understand the elephant's preferences and their effective uh, effectiveness as uh, underpasses. So we, again, here we have, uh, with the preliminary assessment that we have done so far uh, under the follow-up study on ongoing study, we have seen that most of these underpasses, including the small uh, uh, UP, that's with the openness ratio of 2.9, were regularly used, even though it was small, but it was regularly used, except the smallest one that uh, with the openness ratio of 1.39, which we have shown on the, the bottom left image. And uh, the, the, the ones that have high human encroachment also we have seen less usage by the elephant. And here are some of the uh, uh, animals recorded at our uh, underpasses. So we can see boar, one of the large mammal present in our project area. And interestingly, we have also found 
uh, the uh, Asiatic black bear using our underpasses. And we have a, a wild pig, elephants using it. So under the, uh, one of the interesting things that I wanted to share is that even the smallest underpass with just width of just 3.8 meter and the height of just 3.6 meter high, length is similar. It goes it's same for all the section. So openness ratio was only 1.39. Uh, we have recorded an elephant passing through it only once, only once that to a male, I guess it's a male elephant. We, we haven't seen herd of elephant here. So it, it, I'll show you, I don't know if I can play this uh, video. Uh, you, you can see the huge elephant. It doesn't even fit. Uh, it doesn't even fit on in our camera, um, uh, the frame. So, uh, and now, to, in order to confirm this, the, the white usage of this uh, underpass, we need to consider further monitoring, which we are going to do it very soon. So uh, we are maybe by next month, we are going to uh, start monitoring again after, after almost a year of gap because of COVID-19 restriction. So uh, I would uh, like to, uh, present some of the findings, a brief findings of the what we have seen during the pilot study and what we saw, we have seen, what we are seeing under the follow-up study. So I must say that, uh, I must uh, say that the, the follow-up study, the results of follow-up studies are just preliminary in nature and it's draft. So, but still then it's interesting to present the findings that what we have seen from the, uh, the pilot study and comparing it to, uh, not really comparing, but just showing it uh, in the uh, follow-up studies. Under the pilot study, we have just uh, uh, monitored four large underpasses. Under the follow-up studies, we have studied various uh, underpasses from small to the large ones. And in the pilot study, we have just recorded seven wild, different wildlife species. Whereas in the follow-up studies, we have had increased almost double the species have been recorded, the 15 of these. So under pilot studies, out of seven, we have five IUCN red lizard species recorded to be um, the species that use the underpasses. And under the follow-up studies, we have eight IUCN red lizard species. There's an increase again here also. And both, the studies we have uh, the Asian elephant as the prime or a principal uh, wildlife species that is being monitored as, as an Asian elephants. In uh, the pilot study, we have overall crossing rate, average crossing rate. The, I mean the successful crossing rate using the uh, wildlife uh, I mean the passage. Uh, under the pilot study, we have seventy five percent. Overall crossing rate for all species in the follow-up study has decreased, but that's not because the elephants didn't use, I mean, the, the wildlife species are not using it. It's simply because we, have, we haven't completed our entire study. And some of the species the, uh, the, uh, from the 15 species that we have recorded under the ongoing studies, some of these species actually we are not crossing it. They were approaching it, not crossing it. Maybe in the follow-up studies, maybe they will cross it. So we have to see in, in, and get more data on it. And then we'll see the increase in the overall crossing rate. However, we have seen that uh, the successful crossing rate uh, for elephant, uh, Asian elephant in the pilot study was 75.5%. While in the follow-up study, it increased substantially to 88.1% percent. So this, this was just a preliminary uh, findings. Now, I will just like to compare a few, uh, I mean, compare the mon data monitored under the NH2. The, in, while comparing, I'm using only, uh, I'm, I have included only those underpasses that were monitored under the pilot, as well as in the, uh, the following uh, follow-up studies. And for the same species that were monitored, I mean, recorded during the pilot and as well as in the ongoing studies. So having, uh, from this, 
uh, and for the almost similar period, similar period of the uh, of our uh, the monitoring study. As we can see again here, successful crossing rate for Asian elephant has substantially increased, almost by thirteen percent, from seventy five to eighty eight percent. There's a marked increase for uh, the another large mammal, wildlife, gore. It increased all to almost seventy five percent. And for some animals like sambar, it's almost uh, no, not sambar, cero, uh, Himalayan cero, it's almost hundred percent. So you can see uh, the overall percentage again, uh, percentage crossing rate for all species has again increased from seven point three percent by seven point three percent from seventy five to eighty two percent in the follow up studies. Uh, mind you, please. Again, uh, this is a prelim preliminary based on preliminary assessment and then comparing with the, the pilot study. So for meaningful comparison and for meaning, uh, for uh, a proper comparison, we need to do one, uh, uh, maybe for a few more months or maybe a year of data collection, another data collection to compare all season data. So we here have compared with limited data. So even with limited data, there is a very, po I mean, a positive sign of of a very uh, good usage of our uh, uh, our underpasses that has been constructed. So this construction, this uh, under uh, the data comparison was done for the NH2 underpasses. Now we, I just want to compare it with the NH5 uh, underpasses. There's only one underpass constructed under the NH5 since there were no uh, no requirement for underpass in more than one. So under the pilot study, only one wildlife species was recorded. That was Asian elephant uh, in the pilot study. Now, as opposed to in compare, uh, comparing to three species that we recorded during the uh, ongoing study. So we can see uh, by this uh, bar graph in the second, uh, in, the, in the bar graph below, you can see the comparison between elephant usage and the human presence or encroachment. So as human encroachment increases, let's say uh, in the pilot study, there were 339 people on an average, people visited uh, the underpasses. The, you can see here, some of the people are, are enjoying picnic in and around the uh, underpass. And there were uh, the uh, cattle ranch or cow sheds constructed nearby, uh, nearby the underpass that discouraged the use of uh, underpass for almost uh, more than a year. Thanks to COVID, uh, the number of people visiting this, uh, what do you say, the, the underpass area has drastically decreased. And you can see the number of elephants crossing the underpass has also increased substantially from eight individuals to 24 individuals in, in our current study. So we hope that this will increase further because since this underpass is constructed and on, on inside the uh, national uh, wildlife sanctuary, so government has put up a stringent uh, uh, restriction. Now the people, the people cannot come and enjoy like in the past. And now there is a ch check post constructed so that people cannot come and 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 start uh, disturbing the wildlife area. So we. And, in, in another two to three months, or maybe in one year time, we would we would see an increase in number of uh, usage or underpass passage by the uh, Asian elephant. So I would like to conclude. Uh, our studies have found out that number of species uh, recorded comparing to the, the pilot Number of species has doubled, recorded double from the ongoing to the complete uh, to the pilot studies. Yeah? From seven to fifteen species have been recorded. Successful crossing by Asian elephant has increased by thirteen percent. The overall crossing rate for all species has also increased by uh, by comparing um, in comparison to the pilot study, it's increased by seven point three percent. All large underpasses were readily and regularly used by. Uh, Asian elephant, even during the construction period. Smaller underpasses are frequently used, but more data needs to be collected for complete understanding of usage and their effectiveness. So this is our main target, will be main target in upcoming or ongoing studies 
So in, in another few months time, we will be able to understand more, in, get more insight into the usage and the effectiveness of even the smaller and the medium underpasses. Finally, uh, I want to make a statement here that prefabricated metal arch design that we have employed as underpasses proved to be effective for a wide range of wildlife species, including Asian elephant, particularly in the Bhutanese context, because our highways are double lens, not like, uh, not unlike the highways in, in, in India or maybe in Nepal, I, the, there are four lanes. So we are not sure whether this such a, a metal arch underpasses can be constructed in, in the uh, four lane structure, four lane highways, but definitely on the, uh, definitely on the devil lane highways, like in Bhutan, it is effective, it is cost effective, it promote connectivities and highly appropriate for a places, a remote place like in Bhutan. Thank you. Thank you, Karma sir. Uh, Thank you. Very uh, um, interesting and very relevant presentation to our uh, cause of this uh, training program. Um, actually, you shared your experience on uh, RNP uh, two road, um, basically uh, uh, piloting and follow up study of uh, elephant uh, of monitoring of uh, the underpass uses by the by elephant and other animals. And it is really uh, encouraging to note that the elephant started to cross the underpass even during construction period and almost 75% cross during piloting and 88% during um, the follow-up study. So, so that indicates um, if it is a, a more, if the opening, the openness ratio is more, uh, like uh, you said, uh, if it is 2.9, 2 the, the um, uh, animals quite regularly use that underpass. But then if, if it was um, 1.39, the openness ratio, the animal uh, avoided uh, generally that, that underpass. And then uh, that is also associated with the human encroachment. Uh, thank you again, sir, for, for very uh, informative uh, um, presentation. And I guess the best part of this presentation is, um, uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, the prefabricated uh, sort of steel structures are more easier to install and um, uh, readily accepted by the animals. So in that case, a uh, design is, uh, is available, a design is existing. And we can simply uh, re refer to, to, to those uh, design and try to customize it um, to, to our uh, situation. Um, with that, uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, we will um, ask questions at the end of uh, um, the second presentation. So please uh, uh, kindly stay with us until then. The next presentation yes, is- Yes, thank you. Thank uh, you very much. By um, um, Kim Bonain. Um, he is a um, uh, training director and senior analyst conservation strategy fund. Let me quickly uh, introduce you to um, Kim. Um, Kim has over 20 years of experience working at the intersection of environment, economics, and policy. Um, completing a master's of science uh, degree from Stanford University. She has, sorry, I, I, I missed the agenda. She has, in the beginning, sorry, Kim. Um, uh, she has uh, led the implementation of uh, environmental economic purposes and projects in Africa, Asia, the Pacific, and uh, North and South America on themes such as infrastructure development, wildlife conservation, fisheries management, ecosystem service uh, valuation, and tourism economics. So. Um, with this uh, heavy, um, uh, you know, knowledge and long experience, we are uh, uh, very much looking forward to listen uh, to your uh, knowledgeable uh, presentation, Kim. Um, we give you uh, 20 minutes, um, uh, although we are only uh, 10 minutes behind our actual schedule, and that is quite impressive. Uh, thank you for all the presenters uh, for maintaining the timeline. Um, over to you, Kim. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. It's it's really an honor and pleasure. Um, and I want to thank uh, Karma and uh, colleagues at ADB for inviting me to be here today, I guess, um, in my evening, your uh, maybe early afternoon, um, for what I think is the, the final day of what sounds like a really interesting um, and engaging workshop. Um, and so what I hope to do during my presentation is share a little bit about the experience that our organization has had um, over the past almost 25 years working on infrastructure development, particularly transportation infrastructure and roads, 
and perhaps step back a little bit and think about some maybe overarching questions and talk a bit about economic approaches and some economic tools that can help to evaluate and prioritize decisions about road development. So that's what I plan to share with you all today. So the title of my presentation, as I mentioned, is um, Economic Analysis Tools to Support Decision Making. And a lot of this experience that I'm sharing comes from looking at roads in rural areas um, and in wilderness areas. Um, and so I will also credit my colleague, Thais Vilela, who's another economist um, here at my organization, Conservation Strategy Fund. And we've done a lot of analysis of infrastructure development, particularly in Latin America and some in Africa. And so I'm gonna be sharing some of those lessons um, and some of those examples. So the outline is first to present just a few key considerations, perhaps to keep in mind during the presentation and also perhaps later this afternoon when you all are having some additional breakout sessions and discussions. Um, I'm going to talk a bit um, about valuation as sort of a first approach, which I know is just mentioned um, at the end of the coffee break. Um, I'm going to talk about cost benefit analysis and um, very briefly mention least cost path analysis um, for evaluating road projects and then talk a bit about looking at a regional level um, and multi-criteria analysis is one approach that can help um, compare among different options um, and then share some final thoughts. So that's the roadmap, no pun intended, for uh, the presentation um, that I'm going to share with you. And I just wanted to acknowledge that a, um, a lot of what I'm going to be sharing is from a couple of projects that we worked on with um, USAID, as well as um, with support from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation um, here in the United States. Um, and, um, and I didn't mention, I'm based in California, so I'm, I'm greeting all of you from Northern California today, or tonight, my time. Um, so some key consideration, there's three things I wanted to share with you and the first is to think about trade-offs and indirect impacts. So with road development, there are things that are gained and also things that are lost. And so there's different trade-offs and there are some important tools that we can use to think about what are we gaining and what are we losing with um, different types of infrastructure development with putting a road in. And some of those trade-offs involve very direct impacts, for example, to wildlife, um, uh, vehicle collisions, for example. Um, but also some of um, the um, really important impacts to consider are indirect impacts, often things like deforestation, um, some of the induced impacts. Um, and these are often massive. A study about five or six years ago in the Amazon, for example, found that 95% of deforestation um, in the Amazon was within five kilometers of a road or a navigable river. And so there's really huge indirect impacts that are important to consider, particularly with deforestation and, and habitat loss. And also, um, roads tend to bring in illegal activity as well. That's important to consider. They often usher in illegal logging, poaching, mining, um, illegal settlements. And those are also really important impacts to keep in mind. Um, um, diseases such as malaria can also be brought in. So there's a lot of trade-offs to consider. Um, and so that's important to um, have a way to look at those and a way to try to analyze and evaluate. Um, to inform decision making. And then the second key consideration is to look at the net economic benefits, the net benefits in terms of human welfare. And sometimes these, the benefits um, can be assumed um, or it can be presumed that, well, of course, this is good for, for people. This is good for the local communities. 
um, that overall were increasing human welfare and, and public well being by building this road. But sometimes the economic benefit planned in the Amazon, where almost half of them don't have economic benefits greater than their cost. And so what happens if the economic benefits are just assumed, um, sometimes roads that don't make economic sense are being built and public funds, if they're um, funded with public funds, aren't being used um, effectively as they could be. Um, and social and environmental impacts are greater than they need to be. Um, and so it's important to have a way to ask the questions, well, who is getting the benefits? Who's paying the costs? You know, what are the real trade-offs? And then a third key point is avoidance before mitigation. So if we're thinking about how to protect ecosystems, how to protect wildlife, how to safeguard biodiversity, the best way to protect ecosystems and wildlife is avoidance is thinking about, well, how can we achieve these development goals at a lower cost in terms of impacts? Um, so the um, important, it, preventing damage is often much less costly than fixing the damage. Um, and so oftentimes um, a large amount of environmental damage could be avoided by changing a routing or um, choosing alternative road. And sometimes this actually results in lower construction costs as well. So really focusing on avoidance before mitigation is very important and it often results in um, improved outcomes, environmental outcomes, social outcomes and financial outcomes. Um, so what I'm going to share just a few analysis approaches and I'm going to share the studies for anyone who's interested in diving deeper um, but how can we um, use economics to help identify trade-offs and illustrate the economic benefits, kind of making the business case, making the economic case for avoiding impacts and for mitigating those unavoidable impacts? So the first tool that um, might have come up previously in this workshop is economic valuation. And valuation is a way to try and identify, measure, and quantify or monetize when possible, um, all of the different benefits we get from nature, all these different types of ecosystem services um, that the, the benefits we get from nature. And so it's a process of placing a value or a price on goods and services that tend to be left out of market transactions. And so as a result, these often don't have a, a price. It's not easy to compare the, the financial benefits or financial cost of an action with impacts to nature or biodiversity, but it doesn't mean they don't have value. And so price doesn't equal value for, for many, if not most environmental goods and services. Um, and this is due to market failures, like public goods, externalities. Um, they don't naturally have a price that reflects their value. So valuation is an attempt to, to identify and measure um, some part of that value. It's almost impossible to um, try and, and identify or quantify the entire value, but it's a start. Um, and valuation is often a, an important um, foundation to then feed into some of these other analyses that I'm going to share. And I'll just share a very quick example. Um, in Myanmar, um, some official statistics about the forestry sector are that forests contribute you know, less than 1% to the economy, but this is really only measuring commercial timber. But if you actually value the full suite, um, the value is more like 7.3 billion um, versus I think it was 160 million. And if you see here, this red hatched portion was what was initially counted the direct forest income. But there's a whole other suite of important values and goods and services that forests provide that can be measured. Um, and this includes value added to other sectors or also um, ways that forests help protect and avoid damage and losses. So valuation can be really important to help us look at 
you know, what are the real trade-offs? What are we really giving up um, if we deforest? It's not just direct forest income. So valuation can often feed into cost-benefit analysis. So um, I'm guessing most of you might have heard of cost-benefit analysis. Um, the idea of it is fairly straightforward. What are the benefits? What are the costs? Um, we make these decisions every day um, in, in what we do. And so we want to take actions um, where the benefits are greater than the costs. But we need to try to count all of the benefits and all the costs. And that's where valuation can help us try and incorporate some of the most important social environmental costs that might not already have a market price. So it's a framework to evaluate a project or an investment. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a process of identifying, measuring, and comparing benefits and costs. And the idea is it determines whether a project or investment is worthwhile. Um, and you look at a stream of benefits and a stream of costs through time, and you try and put them all into one number called a net present value that helps you try to compare those um, costs and benefits through time and decide if it was worth it, if it makes sense, if it really increases welfare. And it's a decision support tool. It doesn't necessarily tell you whether to do something or not, but it tells you how much it will cost you to do something and whether your benefits um, are greater than the costs. Um, just quickly, there was a study we did in Uganda looking at road development that was being proposed through a national park that was some last remaining habitat for mountain gorillas. And the context was that the um, government of Uganda was um, trying to um, increase roads and access to education and schools, to markets, reduce transport costs, Im improve access to development, and, but also ensure that no um, roadside communities were worse off, also improve performance of the tourism sector. Mountain gorillas are a huge and very important tourism draw for the country of Uganda. Well, what we found when we looked at a number of different routes, um, we looked at two or three different routes and we worked with the Ugandan Roads Authority and sat down with them and talked with them and looked at different routes. And the first result was that the costs were greater than the benefits for all the road options. Um, and the alternatives that were going to cost an additional three to five million more could avoid a potential loss of tens of millions of dollars in lost tourism income from guerrilla groups being negatively impacted by a road going through the park or a paving, additional paving of a road through the park. Um, we also found that many more people would be served by the roads going around the park. So some of the social goals of the roads would be better achieved through the roads going around the park. Um, and so for a very small additional cost, there was a huge potential benefit in safeguarding that tourism income over time. Um, so the conclusions were that tourism investments should focus not so much on building more roads, but on really protecting the gorilla population because the Tourism was already growing very quickly and the number of gorilla permits was already um, maximized. That, that there's no more space to add more tourists. Um, so the focus should really be on growing the gorilla population. So road alternatives should be explored with minimal cost increase, lower risk to tourism, lower risk to gorillas and greater local benefit. So this is an example where doing this type of analysis very early on, can really help to identify perhaps better strategies to achieve development objectives with um, these uh, with road development. Another type of analysis that can be very useful is one that is looking at some spatial mapping layers. And so this is one that um, is called least cost path analysis. So this is where you can take different GIS layers and you can look at this for roads, you can look at this for um, oil pipelines, transmission lines, and you can layer different, um, um, you can put different layers together of things like um, 
sensitive habitats. You can look at um, conservation priorities. You can look at costs, financial costs. And if you layer those together, you can develop different paths that kind of optimize all those different objectives and you find the least cost path. Um, I'll share a quick example. In Indonesia, this is a recent study that came out. There, it was a proposed mining road to come out of the Harapan forest in Sumatra. And what they found through doing this analysis is that if they built the mining roads to go outside the park, not only did it reduce the impacts, the environmental impacts, the impacts to wildlife, to habitat, but also were less costly in terms of construction. So there can be some really useful um, insights looking at this um, type of analysis. Again, this is focusing on, on avoidance. Could we build it differently? Could we pick a different route? Multi-criteria analysis is kind of a, a, another step. Again, looking at some um, data that um, already has been collected on things like protected areas, watersheds, forest cover, biodiversity. Um, um, and those are things you can look at. And so I'm going to share quickly um, an analysis we did in the Amazon looking at, I think it was 85 different planned road segments in the region and trying to compare them to one another to see, well, which ones seem like the best investments that are going to result in the greatest benefits. So with multi-criteria analysis, you can look across a suite of different types of criteria. So environmental, social, economic, um, so deforestation, um, uh, ecological like species cover, protected areas, carbon, water, and then social, access to schools, access to healthcare, some of the positive impacts, but there's also negative impacts like um, crossing through indigenous um, territories or violating laws in place. Um, and then economic, so economic benefits typically are looked at in terms of a fair, fairly narrow range of reduction in travel time, reduction in vehicle wear, and the cost or the investment costs. And what was interesting is in this study, we found that just looking at the economic side, almost half of the proposed roads did not have benefits that justified their investment costs. And that was before even looking at the environmental and social impacts, which both tended to be a net negative impact. So that was very insightful and it highlighted perhaps that the economic analysis isn't being done um, when it should be at the beginning to ask, is this investment worthwhile? Are we getting the public benefit of, of this investment? And so we um, took all of those different segments and put them together um, to to share what is a, a, a pretty powerful result if you think about avoidance, if you think about you know, how can we safeguard and protect the environment, is if you really prioritize those roads that have the greatest economic benefit with the least amount of environmental and social damage, you can achieve 70% of the potential economic benefits of all of these roads, all of these planned roads for only 10% of the total environmental damage of all the roads. So if you don't build the roads that don't make economic sense and have really big impacts, and you do build the roads that make a lot of economic sense with lower impacts, you can have a much more strategic investment of funds in infrastructure development um, and maximize your benefits and minimize um, your losses. So some of the conclusions from that study all road projects generate social and environmental impacts. And there's trade-offs. So there's a choice between economic efficiency and low impact projects. So trying to find the ones that have high economic returns and lower impacts. And there's a lot of potential there to make better choices. So you, there's some win-wins there to cancel projects with economic losses. Um, are there maybe more efficient investments, a better use of funds? than those suggested uh, road projects. And then study roads with high economic efficiency and low impact in greater detail. Um, and also it's really important to invest in these type of analyses and information 
in the planning stages to inform better planning and decision making. And finally, just in this study, we found that by focusing resources on the least risky roads in terms of social and environmental impacts and economic losses, governments in the region could avoid losing more than $7.6 billion and deforestation of more than a million hectares. So th that's, that's not trivial. And so there's really some benefits to focusing on things like that. And so just some final thoughts to share kind of from, from all of that experience is that roads in rural areas, especially in protected areas, often bring a lot of illegal activity, um, illegal resource extraction, immigration, and often result in, in local community disruption. And the local communities often end up worse off with the road, not better off. And environmental and social costs should really be looked at in the beginning of a planning process. Um, and road projects that generate more costs and benefits should, should be avoided or, or changed. And alternatives are often less costly from both a financial and economic point of view. And investing in avoidance can be less expensive than investing in mitigation. So, Looking at alternatives, investing in avoidance first, and then looking at mitigation is, is a good order rather than only looking at the environment once you get to the mitigation stage. So the benefits, not just the costs of safeguard mitigation measures such as wildlife crossings, underpasses like we just heard about, should really be incorporated into the feasibility analysis. And these benefits are often the reduction of social environmental costs. So the environmental and social costs need to be looked at at the beginning in order to be able to say what the benefits of those safeguards are. So those are the final um, thoughts I wanted to share. I have a list of references that I think can be shared with all of you um, later. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kim. Uh, indeed, a very, uh, again, uh, most uh, relevant, and uh, you discussed uh, those issues which are really hot, you know, when uh, we are, we are uh, arguing on uh, uh, biodiversity friendly and environment friendly infrastructure at one hand, and the size of pocket uh, in the other. So uh, the environmental and social cost has to also balance with the economic and financial cost. Um, you also gave a, a very um, relevant experience uh, from Uganda National Park, Windy, uh, if, if I pronounce that correctly, uh, yes. particularly for the gorillas, and then uh, also from Imagine. So, um, you know, uh, like they say, we uh, initiate, we humans uh, generally initiate uh, being cause of uh, ecological uh, disaster and end up as a victim. So um, not to end as a victim, we have to act now. And these are uh, the different uh, tools and, uh, you know, methods by which we can uh, uh, support our decision makers to take appropriate decisions so that uh, the sustainability of the infrastructure, the greening of the uh, transport and the smart transport, uh, that is the agenda, is really so well served. With that, uh, I again uh, thank you, Kim. Now I invite uh, for uh, questions from our participants. So before going for um, um, uh, inviting the participants who are physically uh, here, I will just go through a few comments that has already been posted in the chat box. The first one is for Karmaji. Um, this is from our uh, PD Sushil sir. He has uh, um, queried um, why uh, DOR Bhutan has chosen only underpass. Is there any specific reason? Do you feel the proposed uh, um, the proposed underpass are adequate and sufficiently effective? And in your opinion, for one kilometer road, how long under or overpass is actually required? because there is a huge amount of cost involved for effective uh, wildlife ecology uh, uh, preservation through their safe movement. So th this is a question from our uh, PD, sir. Um, over to you, Karmaji, for your response. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, the, I think the first question was, uh, uh, is the NH5 underpass located inside the national park? 
I, it's actually not uh, the national park. It's the wildlife sanctuary. It's a strict, uh, not really strict, but the wildlife sanctuary. So well, one of the questions that I have noted down is that uh, it's regarding the roads location within the wildlife sanctuary. So what, if so, what were the government administrative formalities you had to be, it had to be complied, you know? Uh, these study were carried out uh, way back in 2009 and 2010. And uh, the, uh, in that uh, study, they, I think the government formalities, most, most of the formalities required was, was that EIA has to be, since the, 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 the road passed through one of the sensitive habitats, particularly the uh, wildlife sanctuary, part of the road. So uh, the ADB and the DOR had to carry out a detailed comprehensive environmental impact assessment for, for this study. So they had done it and they, uh, and, and then the, that was one of the, for, uh, one of the important formalities required as, uh, with the, uh, under the Environment Act of Bhutan. So coming to the next question, uh, why do uh, my, why do our Bhutan has chosen only underpass? So th that's an interesting question, uh, but that's also again, directly uh, uh, relevant to the Bhutan's context, in Bhutan's context, because uh, our area is basically uh, along the, the habitat, elephant habitat within Bhutan is basically uh, semi, uh, hilly and also uh, partly foothill areas. So uh, elephants were basically seen using the uh, river and stream corridors because if they had to cross through the hilly terrains that, that actually took a lot of time for them. So most of the time elephants were using using the rivers and stream beds. So we had uh, the, in those days, so it was recognized that underpasses should be built at the river crossings. So and underpasses where uh, actually the oversizing of the, the drainage structures. Instead of having a smaller structures, we had to increase the sizes, increase the height, increase the width, so that elephants could easily pass through it without uh, a real obstruction for them. So this was one reason why the, and only the underpasses were proposed. The, again, the overpasses were difficult because of the slopes and the hilly terrain, the overpasses were not really feasible. And if we had to build overpasses, then it would be the economy of the road, the, the economic cost of the road would really go high and then it could not be justified. We, again, these roads, particularly the roads built in Bhutan are low intensive, low traffic roads, unlike in other places, like in Nepal, we have thousands of trucks, cars plying every, every hours in Bhutan, in a day, you would have maximum 20, 20 vehicles sometimes in, in remote areas. Sometimes you may have only up to 50, not more than that. So it's really difficult to justify an overpass structure in a scarcely, I mean, uh, traffic road. So that's why the only the, the underpasses were feasible and that could be used as a mitigation because since we also, I think the, the study also found out that Underpasses, uh, the, the the river crossings and the river corridors were used by the elephants, and that uh, we have we have also recorded, and that's the reason why the underpasses were actually uh, proposed in that uh, by the DOR actually. So another, uh, okay. so looking at our data, uh, looking at our uh, findings. We feel that uh, our underpasses are sufficiently effective because uh, we can see even, as I have mentioned in our presentation, even during the construction period, the elephants were using it. So forget about to do it after the construction. Until and unless human beings encroached and disturbed their movement pattern, the elephants were readily using it without any problem. So if the, elef uh, if the underpass was really small, uh, then the... Uh, and then the usage was really uh, very small, actually. In fact, non-existent. Only uh, the smallest underpass that we uh, monitored had only one uh, elephant passing through it in entire one year uh, monitoring. So we can see that uh, those small underpass really 
really <laughs> it's not feasible for for elephants to pass and particularly for those uh, the with the herd elephants they feel really uh, i mean uh, trapped and they feel it's dangerous for for with, with their young ones to go through those small underpasses and once we have sufficient uh, openness they pass through it without any problem on the last uh, the question in your opinion in bhutan's context uh, the number of requirement of the underpasses and overpasses is i think quite challenging to find out because of the nature of terrain because elephants really elephants and other then we haven't uh, really seen into the other species of wildlife but we have mostly we have actually 100% almost 100% of our effort was directed towards the elephant so elephants basically use the gentle terrain and the underpass i mean the river crossings so and we have almost we had nine river crossings particularly in in the nh2 that i have uh, i have uh, shown in my presentation we have nine river crossings of nine river crossing we have constructed seven of the underpasses which were almost uh, which could be used by elephants so that means for a, uh, almost for uh, 7 to 8 kilometers I, I'm, i'm not very sure so for that we have almost nine seven undercrossings underpasses so uh, i'm not very sure at this point how effective or how how many passes are required in the context of bhutan uh, the it is all determined by the, the by the passage route and unlike in other in other countries where you have so many places where elephants can go and pass through readily so uh, I, i'm not sure particularly in, in in other countries but in bhutan in buddhist context yes definitely the the river crossings were the best uh, location where we could install the underpasses thank you thank you karmaji uh, sir do you have any further query or Yeah. Yeah. It is there in the chat box. Yeah. I'm still not there. Okay. Uh, to Kim again by uh, our PD sir, Kim. Um, thank you, Kim, for your excellent presentation. The trade-off between economic benefit and environment damage is the subject you have beautifully explained through a graph. But how it may be assessed? Is it an uh, subjective assessment? Can you please simplify it? Over to you, Kim. That's a that's a great question, and in half an hour, I can I can explain it. <laughs> um, no, so th there's a couple of ways you can try to to look at this. So, with multi criteria analysis, the example I showed with that graph, that is taking some things that cannot be quantified or monetized. So um, what you can do is you can create um, an index and you can look at all those different criteria and you can, so it, it's somewhat subjective. And this is where this type of, of analysis needs to be done in a consultation process um, with stakeholders, with other people to decide all of those different aspects, access to healthcare, um, access to schools, um, uh, deforestation, loss of water quality, um, um, loss of biodiversity, do those have different um, weights? Should they be all considered equally or you can also weight them and then put them all together in an index? So what we did in this analysis, for example, is we took the economic benefits, so the economic analysis of the um, total net benefits of the road, then we divided it by a socio um, kind of environmental damage score that we calculated based on all of those different aspects. Um, and we just weighted those everything equally to be just very simple and transparent, but you could decide to change the weighting of things. Um, and then each road then can be looked at as the economic efficiency as a function of social and environmental damage. 
And then you can compare the roads to one another. So it's not an absolute um, objective number, but it's one that you apply the same approach to all the roads, and then it allows you to compare them to one another um, in regards to what criteria you've used. And so I invite you also to take a look at the paper because that'll explain it also in, in more detail, but I hope that somewhat answers your question. Um, there's definitely room for um, being very clear and transparent and consistent, but there's also room for people to bring in their subjective weights of what's important um, that, could, that you can bring people to the table for a really interesting um, conversation and discussion. Thank you, Kim. Um, thank you, Kim. Uh, if there is uh, any question from the floor, I invite. In the meantime, let me ask a question myself. Uh, Kim, you uh, mentioned three types of uh, analysis. One is cost-benefit analysis, and then least cost path, and then multi-class criteria analysis. So which one is uh, more, uh, gives more precision um, the result? And um, if we have to uh, decide on a specific type of analysis, what is the, you know, uh, the situation that uh, actually uh, prompts us to use a certain type? Uh, yeah. That's a really, really good question. And I, I probably don't have a satisfactory answer, but I'll, I'll share some thoughts about it. Cost benefit analysis, I think is the one that gives you the most, I wouldn't say precise, but I would say objective, clear answer of this is the net change in welfare. This is the net economic benefit of this project. And so that's pretty straightforward. The challenge is that everything that goes into that analysis has to be monetized, has to be in terms of money. And you can use valuation, you can use techniques to try and include as many things as you can, but in the end, your analysis will only include some, some things. Sometimes that's enough. Sometimes you feel like we've included enough of what's really important in that cost benefit analysis, but it will only ever be an incomplete way to look at all of the different impacts. So what we usually encourage is that along with, if possible, some of these spatial analyses Sometimes you don't have the data to do a cost benefit analysis. And sometimes what's most important might not be possible to value in monetary terms. And then you have, I think, a, um, the opportunity to use more visualization and spatial mapping and layers to look at more qualitative things that are important that you can't maybe quantify or you can't monetize, but they are very important and you wanna look at how does, do these options pass through um, indigenous territories? That's not something you can put into a dollar value, but you might really wanna look at it. So I think it depends on what are the issues that are most important, what really matters, and then what things can you measure and in terms of what type of data. And then that can help guide you, I think, to the type of analysis that can be most useful. And the most complete analysis that we tried, I think is the last one I shared, the multi-criteria analysis, where we included a lot of different things, but then it does get a little harder to explain. It is, can be a little bit more subjective, but in another way, it's more complete in some ways because you're really trying to look um, and those are most useful, I would argue, when you're comparing among projects, because you're not going to get to an absolute dollar value. You're just going to say this project has relatively more or less impacts in terms of X, Y, Z criteria than this project. And that allows you to compare one with the other. Um, so I think there's, it, 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 as economists are famous for answering, it depends. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Kim. Uh, we understand we need to get more educated on this by you, and that requires a lot of time. Um, 
Okay, now um, uh, any any questions from the floor for uh, Karma or Kim? Yes, madam, please go ahead. Uh, you, yeah, you can come here. Namaste uh, everyone. So my question is uh, to Karma. I really wanted to know, uh, like, um, as the study outlines the effectiveness of underpasses based on the openness. So is it only specific to elephants, or does it work for other uh, animals as well? I um, actually the the study was mainly for the Asian elephant, but definitely we have. Uh, definitely, we have seen uh, we have used it for other wildlife species, and then um, as we have, as I have presented in my presentation, we have fifteen uh, different species, and we have seen the effectiveness for all the species. Just now, I have presented for the purpose of uh, clarity and for the purpose of specificity. I presented only for the Asian elephant. But definitely, it is effective for all the wildlife species, including the large mammal that like gore, sambar, and other species. Even uh, we have re even recorded the the, uh, the passage uh, of the uh, the cat species like leopards and uh, smaller cats, the bears, the wild dogs. So uh, I think it includes for all. But for the purpose of uh, for, for the study and the specificity for the presentation, uh, it's actually mainly focused on the Asian elephant because the underpass was actually meant for uh, Asian elephant, but definitely those bigger underpasses means any animal or any wildlife species which approach it, we studied it and we seen whether they uh, it, it repelled them or it encouraged them to pass through. So we have, uh, we have uh, I think uh, in few months time we'll be able to see in greater details about the new species whether they were able to pass through and what is their effective crossing rates and we, we maybe we'll share in future yeah thank you <clears throat> thank you madam uh, she was from dr bear uh, thank you karmaji for the response uh, any any further queries any further questions on the floor you saying can I? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, Mr. Karma. I, I had a question more from a uh, the selection of the type of structure you used. I, you know, virtually all yours are there are metal covert or, or you know, multiplate uh, metal structures compared to what you see very often or, or concrete more considered bridges. So you're looking at what we call buried bridges versus you know more traditional concrete simple span bridges. I'm just curious. Is it just based on economics, because, uh, the, the selection of them, or the, was there some other criteria of why that was chosen? Um, uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. And uh, that's very interesting uh, question for me because uh, actually uh, I was not the one who actually proposed such structure. Uh, we had, uh, on, in the, when we were the, conducting the study and uh, we had, uh, the our team leader from Australia who was quite uh, used to all the structure, the prefabricated structure. And since uh, our roads are really in a remote area, having us, uh, and then with very limited time to construct several uh, cross drainages. So he proposed that prefabricated structure uh, with, which has ease to use and then uh, uh, substantial, I mean, uh, also takes less duration to construct. So that was the reason why, and we have chosen a prefabricated structure. And it, uh, there's no, I mean, and also because the economics, it's cheaper com comparing to the other structure. So that's the main reason why we had, uh, we had to go for underpasses that was uh, unlike the other concrete box type or slab type or a breach type. So we had to go for the, the, the uh, metal arches which are easy to install, bring it on the site and directly readily install it, yeah. That was the reason. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I understand from a, the, uh, from a wildlife standpoint, either, either type of structure is adequate or you know, is desirable. And often in the, like in the United States, for instance, in some Western yes. countries, buried bridges are less expensive than other types of bridges. So thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, yes.
Thank you, uh, Gordon, for your question. Uh, Karmaji, one more uh, question to you from uh, Nitra Sarma, USAID. Um, uh, he has uh, asked uh, whether, uh, do, do you mean that, uh, you know, larger uh, underpass or overpasses are more uh, effective? Um, yeah. Uh, can, can you reply, um, can you... Uh, uh, okay. Netraji has asked, um, does it mean that uh, these large uh, underpasses or overpasses are more effective than the smaller ones for the animals? Uh, actually, it's quite uh, com uh, quite tricky here because the, some of the larger passes which we thought were would be used by elephants regularly and frequently may, more often, whereas came out to be uh, less used because again, uh, it depends on human use. And they, I have shown uh, a graph where if there is a human encroachment into the underpasses or nearby underpasses, the elephants tend, they, they, I mean, normally tend not to use it because the, and the, the one of the underpasses in the core of the, the NH2, although it was just small, uh, the openness ratio was just two, uh, two, and it was readily used because it's away from the human encroachment uh, area, the settlement area, and then there's less human encroachment. The elephants were readily using it. And then we have seen herds of elephants, although it's very, I mean, slightly bigger than the smallest one that I've shown, it was readily used. So uh, I think we need to uh, study further. So in order to confirm the effectivity of the structures and compare it, uh, but definitely the human encroachment was the main reason why elephants were not using it regularly. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Karmaji. Uh, any, any more queries? I guess uh, um, we have a very uh, active and uh, good uh, sort of participation. Uh, yes, I um, probably with this, um, we have come to uh, an end of uh, the presentation and uh, uh, so presentation sessions. Um, after uh, this, we'll uh, start uh, preparing the group. We'll go for a group exercise. Um, and then um, uh, after formation of the group and uh, uh, agreeing on some ground rules, uh, we'll uh, break and uh, go for lunch break. Um, it, it will be uh, good if um, Kim Karmaji uh, keeps on staying with us, but uh, we know that uh, you have very uh, tight schedule and uh, if, if uh, at any time of time, uh, you know, this uh, uh, program going on, uh, you feel uh, to leave, please uh, feel free to do so. Um, uh, I'll hand over now to uh, Clara yeah, to uh, uh, do this uh, group form, group formation. Uh, Karmaji has already done. So um, the, the groups in different tables are uh, as per suggested by um, uh, uh, Karma Yangam. Um, secondly, uh, if you see at the back of uh, one of the nameplate, uh, we have uh, written uh, one of the four uh, thematic areas based on which we, we are going to do this uh, discussion. And these uh, four thematic areas are uh, policy. Um, and then um, research and development science, uh, then uh, uh, practice and implementation, and capacity building and best management practices. So these are the four uh, thematic areas that um, uh, each of the group will uh, discuss, and you will prepare uh, that as, uh, as uh, uh, Clara will suggest now. Um, but then also please um, uh, take it this way that uh, although you are uh, working on one thematic area, it doesn't mean that you have to be limited to, the, to only that, that theme because uh, you will identify a uh, group leader among the, the four tables and um, also a note taker who will be uh, facilitating you. Um, but then, um, you know, when uh, one group uh, presents, then uh, there will be ample opportunity for uh, other uh, group members to also uh, express their views, uh, argue on uh, issues, or even add if they have any new or innovative idea. With this, I hand over to uh, Clara. Clara, please take over. Thank you, Deepak, for the summary. Uh, in fact, I will repeat more or less what Deepak <laughs> said, but with but, but a little bit more detail and the time that you, that you have. So, um, 
So as I, I told before, the main goal is to identify the needs and priorities to promote green roads and smart infrastructure. And we will discuss around key uh, four key areas. So policy, permitting, research science, uh, practice implementation and training capacity, best management practices. So uh, the first 15 minutes, uh, we wanted to, the group will be uh, already uh, defined. So it's more or less defined because uh, it's for each uh, table. Um, the virtual participants will join uh, the, the group through the, the, the rooms, the virtual uh, rooms. And you have in 15 minutes to define who will be the leader uh, the spokesperson uh, and who will be the note uh, taker that will write in a Google Drive. <laughs> they are starting to... <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, well, ideally the group should be inc should include a high diversity, but uh, the people will already be assigned. So I think there was this um, uh, concern about diversity to talk about these uh, topics. So um, each in-person uh, in participant group or leader will have a computer. You will have, Suman will take care of, of that. Um, so, and I believe that for the virtual, the room one is policy, room two research, room three uh, practice implementation and room four training capacity, uh, best management practices. Uh, each computer will have the Google Chrome because it's the only way that you have you reach to the uh, the, uh, the Google Drive link. I will I will share you what we have in the Google Drive link. So what we have here is more or less what you have printed in your tables. So I will give um, an example. So um, this will be the first. Uh, it's a white paper, and you will list. Uh, after discussion, the list of challenges, obstacles, and needs. And this um, will be uh, then shared to the, the, re the remaining participants. I will, I will talk about this later, only to show you the, the, the documents that are here. And then uh, we will, uh, and then I will compile that, um, the, the, the challenges, and I will add here to you guys, everybody will vote what is the first priority, what is the second priority and third priority. And then you go to the second form where you use the, the, the results of the, of the votation and you try to fill in like, like the priority number one, what is the need and try to justify why and what will be the action what you suggest in terms of respons uh, responsibility, so we we'll be, could be in charge of that, and what you think would, could be the most um, um, better timeline to, to achieve the, this goal. So you have like different priorities, so uh, ranking according to the, the votation, and you can add more priorities if you have uh, more. So this, you have two uh, forms too, uh, fill in and also the votation that I will um, show you and then uh, you vote and I, I will wait and then we vote for another topic and so on. So go back to, to the presentation. Okay, so this is the, the Google Drive link that I will share in the, in the chat. And then uh, you have 45 minutes uh, to... Um, complete the list, uh, well, you will see the list of uh, questions that is only suggestions uh, to guide for the discussion. You have much more questions for sure um, uh, for each topic. And then with that, you identify the challenges, obstacles, uh, and et cetera, and the leader of each group will facilitate the discussion and the note taker will write directly in the forms of the Google Google Drive that will help me to uh, uh, compile that information and put in the poll, you know. So we have 45 minutes, so it's it's very short time. Um, we have suggestions in terms of note takers. So for policy, we have Deepak, for researcher, Rakish, practice, Yubra, and uh, for uh, um, training, Gordon Keller. If you agree, we can keep with that. <laughs> And um, so you fill uh, in that form, 
one list of challenges, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And, um, and then we have 30 minutes that each group have more or less six minutes to show to everybody so they can come here and, um, and share the, the list of challenges that you, you fill in in the, in the form. Do everybody knows and why you decided uh, to, to, to have this list of challenges, obstacles and needs um, to, to people know how to vote, okay? So it's only six minutes. And then you have a tea break. While you have the tea break, I will compile all that information for the votation. Um, and then I will share this uh, link. So you, you go to your um, uh, cell phone uh, and write uh, www.meti.com. And for I will share afterwards for each topic, you have a code and in code, you have you can rank like what is the first that you think that is uh, uh, more priority second third fourth and so on so it's very easy and super fun and after the results so i will share the results here and you will know the the results uh you go back to your groups and try to fill in well 45 minutes that the time that we have the, this second form, the action timeline responsible for action and so on. And I think it's, it's it. That's it. If you have any questions, I, can, I, I will be around the group, so I will support you. Like if, if you have any questions. Parmaji um, has uh, suggested because there are five uh, virtual participants. There are five virtual participants. Okay. So you have to also uh, tell them, inform them uh, they how will, they are going inside in the breaking. So they will assign the room related yeah. with the topic. Uh -huh. And then uh, uh, each group will uh, reach to these virtual participants. Okay. I, I will make sure that everything will be okay. okay. Uh, I thought we should just cross check with because since we will be breaking for lunch now first before the group exercise, right? Sorry. Um, I don't we're gonna be very well. Hello? Hello? Can yes. you hear me? Uh, so I was suggesting if we can uh, quickly inform the group participants. I think Chris, uh, we've already communicated with them uh, from the virtual participants, but we can cross check again if they are aware about their uh, group assignments. So for example, uh, I think Netraji, you're participating, right? In the group work, uh, we have assigned you to group number three on uh, under practice and implementation. So uh, I think uh, later on when we go into the Zoom, uh, the different groups, so I think you will automatically be sent there. Right, Chris? Yes, that is right. That is correct. We have uh, Nitraji in group three, um, and then uh, who else is there? Um, Somia, Mr. Somia Anand, is this uh, online or? Uh, I think Somia Anand is a virtual participant, right? We have assigned you to group four. Group four, and then uh, we it have Gordon. Saranga. Saranga. Group one. Karma, I'm here. Yes, so we have assigned you to group one. Mm -hmm. so, and then uh, we have uh, T, T. Kohli. If you are still there, we have assigned you to group two. Is that okay? Um, and then who else is there? Thank you, ma'am. Sandish. Uh, I, I don't see Sandesh. Oh, yes, Sandesh. Uh, Mr. Sandesh Hamal. So you have been assigned to group number one. Please uh, take note. And you anyway, you will automatically be sent to these groups later. Uh, is there anyone else? So I think there are some of us from the organizing team. So I will just jump in and jump out of from some of the rooms. So I think we've covered all the virtual participants, right, Chris? That, yes. that are right now available online. Yeah. 
Karma, Karma Chugil, you are still there. Would you like to join the group discussion in the afternoon, Karma? After the lunch break? You're very welcome if you want to stay on. Uh, hello. Uh, okay. I'm still here. I'm just listening. Okay. Would you like to join the group exercise in the afternoon, Karma? Uh, yes, yes. At what time uh, it starts from? So there will be a one hour lunch break now and then after that. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, I think we can uh, assign karma to, where do we have the least number of people? Um, uh, we have two, three, and four. <laughs> Just two per group. Okay, so maybe group two, karma, research and science, okay. if we can assign you. Okay, since you are okay, okay. okay. Yes. Thank you, Karma. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is there any virtual participant that we have missed? Uh, please uh, raise your voice and let us know. We hope we didn't miss anyone. And uh, I'm happy to be a leader of that group, uh, which has worked out on the deficiencies uh, in the policy. Uh, we really had a very good uh, group discussion, both uh, the the physical participants as well as the participants who are present virtually. Uh, while listing down the issues, uh, we have uh, listed the 10 main issues. We have listed uh, 10 main issues and uh, the number one is a lack of interlinkage between different policies. Uh, we have a policy regarding the environment, we have policy regarding the transportation, we have policy regarding the climate change and also regarding the wildlife protection. But there is a lack of proper interlinkage between those different policy. That is, uh, uh, so um, talking about the deficiencies in the policy is the lack of uh, stakeholder consultation during the policy formulation. And uh, again, the policy that are prevalent, they are prepared without any proper research or analysis. Uh, no um, experts uh, are included during the policy formulation, which later on creates hindrance uh, during the implementation. And uh, in Nepal, there are currently three tiers of government, and uh, each tier of government or each level of government is pre preparing their own policy or rules and regulation for the environment protection. And sometimes they even contradict with each other. So that's uh, which is not supposed to do, supposed to be. And uh, there is lack of resources, resources in terms of budget, resources in terms of uh, uh, human resources and uh, the technical knowledge. Uh, and also the lack of accountability um, from the duty bearers and also the um, lack of ownership from the local stakeholders or the right holders. Also, you know, so in some of the policies or rules, the regulation, new provisions are there and they are not properly disseminated. For example, the strategic in the provision of a strategic environment assessment uh, has been adopted in the new Environment Protection Act, but it is not uh, well disseminated among the concerned uh, stakeholders or, or the concerned projects or the ministry or the department. So that is also not a good practice. And uh, during the um, monitoring or the evaluation of the project, uh, uh, there should be a joint monitoring. Like if there is an infrastructure project, uh, there should be monitoring from the maybe forest or environment or the wildlife, um, but that doesn't generally happens. So it's also uh, an issue. Uh, and you know, some of the provisions in the environment protection or the wildlife protection, they are supposed to be bounded by the guidelines of the donor which should not happen in the case. For example, we try to comply with the EMPs and everything in case of donor funded project, but somehow we ignore in, if that is in the, that is the local, local funded project or the government funded project. So that is also an issue. And again, uh, during uh, the monitoring and evaluation, uh, the monitoring and evaluation does not happen uh, in the proper uh, quantity or the proper frequency, that is an issue. And also their recordings are not kept very well um, because if uh, those uh, recordings are done properly, it will help on the later on stage for the feedback and everything. So these are the main issues that we have listed here. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So we are from the Research and the Science Group. Uh, we have a lot of uh, challenges, issues, and uh, needs, and then uh, we have a uh, uh, opportunity also. But we have uh, ten now. We have the ten. Clara has said that we can only mention about the ten. So it's a colored one. Just see the color with, the, with highlighted one. The first challenge uh, for the research and the science uh, theme is uh, about the lack of limited database at national level. We have a lack of limited. There are the database uh, that is a fragmented database. Each and every office they have their own database, but there is no database at the national level. Uh, the, for the uh, sake of the institutional memory, we need the database. If someone is changed or transferred, there are no uh, available data for that one, for projects. So it's the challenge that there should be uh, national level database. The one challenge, main challenge is a lack of limited uh, database. And the second one is uh, limited fund, institutional capacity, professional expertise. For the, for the database, that is not the priority of the government. So there is very limited uh, fund allocation for the preparation of the database. Uh, so it's like challenges. And then another challenge is the inadequate understanding and the coordination among different executing agencies. So like for this uh, uh, wildlife friendly or biodiversity conservation uh, safeguards uh, aspects. So there are a lot of uh, development agencies and then conservation agencies they are involved in the for that one but there is uh, no proper uh, or inadequate understanding and the coordination among these different stakeholders so that is one challenge another challenge uh, and then limited case studies and their dissemination there are some good practices being uh, practiced by the different agencies like the department of road or the department of electricity or conservation offices but they are not documented properly and even some are documented, but they are not disseminated properly. So there is no wider dissemination of the uh, case studies, good practices. So that may be one challenge. Uh, uh, lack of joint monitoring and evaluation by uh, conservation and development agency. Like so suppose we have a prepared, we have constructed the uh, wildlife friendly infrastructures. If there is no joint monitoring from the uh, conservation offices like protected offices and concerned project offices of con concerned department. So the, there is a question of the sustainability of that uh, infrastructures. Like we, we, we have the underpass. What no, no, keep going. Okay. I'll, I'll so, you here. okay. So that's why uh, there should be joint monitoring from both agencies. There is a budget for that one for conservation office as well as from the uh, project procurement. So there should be joint monitoring for that one. Uh, and then the, the needs, uh, the, under the needs, understanding actually situation of biodiversity vulnerability. So we are talking about the database because it is needed that we, we know the uh, actual situation of, of what is the vulnerability of the biodiversity, what are the safeguard measures for the uh, biodiversity conservations due to the linear infrastructure, due to the road or other linear infrastructures. And then I will note that the last one is uh, stakeholders collaborative effort in various stages of project cycle. So there are different scale, uh, stages of the project cycle, starting from the pre-feasibility to the implementation, the post-implementation. Uh, so the, all these stages, there should be the uh, collaboration. Like uh, the, if some roads are, if some road is passing through the uh, protected area. So with the collaboration should be started, initiated from the beginning of the, that project, from the beginning cycle, not only in the, during the implementation or during the planning only. So from the pre-planning to the post-planning, for the all stages, there should be involvement or joint uh, collaboration between the conservation and the development agencies. So these are the all uh, 10, yes, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we. Uh, did rigorous discussion uh, and I would like to thank uh, Netra Sarama sir who is participating online and uh, has given his uh, contribution for finalizing this. Uh, these are priority uh, points. Yeah. Uh, regarding practice and implementation, 
in regards with uh, uh, these uh, uh, smart infrastructures, we have noted these 10, um, 10 issues as a major issues. Here, I would like to express them one by one. Uh, first is weak technical and ecological know-how among the planner and decision makers. This is one of the most important uh, lacking with us or challenges to us. Uh, and we have our own understanding and not proper understanding about the uh, um, exact requirement for uh, yeah, need of these uh, uh, um, smart infrastructures. Similarly, next is the big need but limited baseline information. We have very limited baseline information regarding the uh, project implement implementation areas, especially which is very essential before implementing those uh, projects. We don't know what what type of species are there, uh, whether uh, those species could be uh, affected to what level we are uh, not getting such sorts of uh, baseline information. Even though there is a practice to have uh, to take baseline information, these are not sufficiently uh, collected or not presented well as uh, previous uh, previously as a uh, sponsor also stated that uh, there is lack of documentation uh, very similar issue is uh, reflecting by this third is the multiple technical agencies and poor coordination and limited attention there are so many agencies working for the same work but uh, no work has been done that is the situation here so it is one of the major challenges associated with us. And next is uh, the uh, no adequate budget, no adequate budget and human resources. Uh, while uh, preparing the project estimates and we are not considering the uh, smart or environment friendly linear infrastructures because it needs huge budget and it is lacking for us so it is it has not given uh, priority and even for present moment there is uh, no uh, practice of allocating surplus budget for making uh, smart infrastructures or uh, documentation and dissemination of best practices and lesson learned. We have so many lesson learned and best practices which can be replicated to other projects. And uh, at present, even though that sorts of uh, best practices records we have, we cannot, uh, we are being unable to transfer those sorts of uh, information to other projects so that they could get uh, benefit from our lessons and they can learn some, um, they can prevent them from doing some mistakes as well. So that sorts of dissemination is lacking. Uh, so uh, next is poor IEIA compliance monitoring, accountability and reporting practice or system. Yeah, you Compliance monitoring is very poor in case of Nepal and no one is uh, taking uh, consideration of the implemented, um, you know, how to implement the mitigation measures. As mitigation measures are proposed in the EIA, EMAP is there, contractor has given the EMAP and there will be no implementation and nobody is uh, monitoring it. So due to lack of compliance monitoring, uh, our mitigation measures are not implemented in the field. So even though there are huge EIA documents, it is only the waste of papers for now. I hope it will be improved in future. 
Okay, next is lack of holistic and integrated project planning, coordination, implementation committee, uh, or practice. Yeah, we need a holistic approach to implement, uh, to sort all kinds of complications uh, while implementing the project. So that sort of holistic committee should be there where there will be stakeholders, uh, representatives, and they can solve the problem in this committee and give specific mitigations or way out so that the uh, complication or the issue will be solved and project can run uh, smoothly. So next is policy order and ambiguity among various acts, rules, regulations, and guidelines. There are so many policies, so many rules and regulations in our uh, countries. Every agency have their own rule and we are moving with our own rule. And project is uh, suffering with those uh, ambiguities. So that should be solved. Next is no adequate economic and environmental analysis for identification, design, implementation, and monitoring, and reporting of infrastructure projects. So while implementing the infrastructure project, we are not performing uh, real economic analysis. That covers all aspects of the um, uh, resource utilization. We are not considering biodiversity as uh, our resource. Due to is all investment for, uh, for protection of, or for conservation of biodiversity will be considered as a loss instead of taking it as a resource. That should be corrected. And next is lack of adequate budget to implement uh, environmental mitigation measures identified in EIA, IAE, and contract agreement documents. Yeah, in our contract nowadays, there is a contractual provision that uh, contractors should implement all the uh, environmental mitigations mentioned in the report. However, due to lack of budget to implement the um, mitigation measures, contractor is denying to implement the <clears throat> mitigation measures. And really, even though the issue has uh, flagged out in the study report, it could not be uh, really implemented in the field. So this is the scenario. And now uh, with this, uh, I'll uh, com I, I would like to announce that I have completed my issues. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ms. Gordon, uh, Mr. Uzal, Mr. Soba, Mr. Ramesh, and also uh, Parma, who has also contributed personally on the, for this uh, assignment. Uh, actually, our, our topic was uh, how to uh, develop the capacity of uh, the different agencies responsible for the construction of uh, linear infrastructure projects, ensuring the protection of wildlife habitat, uh, biodiversity, like this. So uh, we have listed down some uh, major issues, which we can take as a challenge or needs uh, for this uh, capacity development. Uh, first of uh, uh, the first one is uh, like uh, we are now most uh, most of us are from DOR, so we are. Uh, considering DUR as a focal institution. Uh, in our DUR, we have got uh, one environmental unit. Also in our ministry also, we have got environment unit, but I think it's very small to look after all these things. Uh, and we don't have also uh, the wildlife expert or biodiversity experts, a uh, dedicated person to look after the this kind of issues. Um, so I think, uh, and the, the environment unit need to have uh, look over the more than I think 200 or 300 projects a year. So they don't have, maybe may not have even enough time to give uh, for this uh, wildlife issues and biodiversity. So we need to make the environment unit a little bit stronger, bigger with the uh, list of uh, experts and consultants. Uh, that's one thing. And the one is, uh, I will uh, mention that uh, we don't have wildlife export 
uh, till now. We have only environmentalists, we have only sociologists, but we don't have wildlife experts. So we are now focusing on the uh, protection of wildlife export and biodiversity. So I think we need to have some wildlife export, uh, dedicated wildlife export, both in the department and in the ministry. And also in the, like the, the projects we're handling the ADB project, ADB directorate, also in World Bank, where we are mostly focused on the bigger projects, uh, working in the production areas, sensitive areas. So we need to uh, hire such experts so that they can help us in the uh, proper implementation of uh, energy infrastructure projects ensuring the protection of wildlife habitat and species. Uh, this one is not, uh, this one is equally important, not only to uh, DUR, but also to other departments like Department of Urban Planning, Department of uh, uh, Electricity Authority, and uh, other provincial government or local government also, because also they are also nowadays involved in the construction of uh, roads or railways and other linear infrastructures. And, might be they have to also in the such uh, protected area. So they should also be empowered, not only DUR, all, but all those departments also. Um, another one is uh, we, we are not most trained with this biodiversity or wildlife uh, habitat. Uh, we are mainly focused on the construction of roads and structures. Uh, but nowadays, this biodiversity protection issue is emerging. So uh, all the road agencies will be road or the other linear infrastructure implementing agencies will be empowered with the training related to the biodiversity, wildlife, and the importance and the needs of the, those things, uh, so that uh, those pers uh, persons will be empowered for the, the, for the successful implementation of these uh, projects, uh, for, uh, along with the protection of the environment. So another one, uh, we have, uh, we should have, uh, uh, better coordination with the uh, other line, line agencies like uh, National Park and Forestry and Wildlife because uh, we are now constructing the roads, uh, railways in those uh, in the areas uh, under their jurisdiction, but uh, um, we should have good coordination. We should go parallel, one go, go hand by hand. Otherwise, uh, uh, protection, conservation areas, people, they think only about the wildlife and and the protection of uh, habitat or uh, biodiversity. And if you only think about road infrastructure or railway, so then uh, we cannot come up to the one optimum solution. We should bring, uh, we should build the infrastructure projects as well as we should protect the environment, protect the um, biodiversity, habitat, wildlife. So this should be a good coordination between the uh, uh, residents of different line agencies also. Uh, another one is we, we are also lacking lack of uh, manuals or guidelines like these things, documents, standards, uh, which we can apply while uh, planning or designing such uh, linear infrastructure projects. We have some um, uh, guidelines like uh, act or regulation related to the environment, but we don't have uh, specific guidelines related to the wildlife. Recently, we have got one directives passed from the uh, cabinet, uh, which uh, explains about the necessity of different structures while we are constructing the roads or railways or other infrastructure along the protected area, uh, that will, I think, uh, is one great step forward. But still, we need, I think, some more documents, documentation uh, to ensure these things. Also, we are uh, uh, somehow uh, having challenges regarding the database, collection of data, uh, different kind of data, different like uh, wildlife. Uh, uh, data, uh, biodiversity, species data, and also the road kill data, uh, and uh, we don't have such, such things. I think we should uh, develop some, maybe some apps or tools uh, so that uh, we can collect the data and utilize them so that we can use them in the future planning and design uh, to ensure the uh, protection of environment and wildlife. And also the same thing, I think, uh, for project design. We need to have a, a proper, proper study regarding the protection of environment and the sensitivity of those uh, protected areas. Uh, but we are lagging that thing. So this, uh, this will be some uh, specific planning and study, especially in the protection areas, protected areas, before we go for the project design. And 
also uh, the local governments, as I already mentioned that even the local governments are now uh, constructing the mainly the roadways in those uh, forest areas or national park areas. But uh, uh, and also we are also constructing the roads and railways and sustainable infrastructure in those in the areas where there are already local governments. So we should have some good coordination. Without good coordination, I think it will be difficult to implement the project successfully. Like yesterday, we talked about the fencing, and Mr. Gordon raised a question about whether the local people will allow for the fencing or not while constructing the overpass or underpass. So this is, this is the issue. So we should have good coordination with the local government also while implementing any project. And uh, another one is, uh, uh, because uh, this uh, protection of uh, the wildlife uh, species and protection of uh, habitat, these things are uh, pretty new for us. Uh, so we are not uh, that much habitual of these things. So we need to have some more exposure and knowledge and experience sharing. So from the uh, different presentation uh, so far, we came to know that there are some, some good practices uh, around our uh, around neighboring countries like India, Bhutan, and other countries also. Maybe we have uh, we may have to uh, visit those things, those places, and uh, get acquired to those uh, good practices to protect the environment and the biodiversity, wildlife. And uh, the last thing we have also mentioned one thing: whether it's uh, too much turnover of ten person, especially in the government uh, jobs. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes not many times it happens that one person stays for six or eight months, then another person. Uh, comes in that place and the things one guy have ex uh, experience or gain, they you may not uh, have opportunity to use that thing. So there's also one one challenges we are facing. So these are the some challenges of cycles and needs regarding the capacity development uh, for the construction of uh, green road and smart infrastructure road uh, and ensuring the protection of uh, wildlife. Thank you. We are in the third year. Uh, from first day, we came to learn various uh, techniques or say technologies that we can use in our infrastructure to have wildlife uh, crossings that uh, animal corridors that are uh, friendly uh, or say our infrastructure should be maintained uh, with uh, uh, biodiversity, it should be interlinked with each other. Uh, uh, actually, the development work is for all the uh, members of the society. So if we have any planning, let's think about whether that planning will help to the sustainable development or not. Okay. And one of the points that we should uh, remember or say discuss uh, is the biodiversity conservation, uh, which ultimately lead to the sustainable development of our society. Uh, before entering to the closing session, I would like to request uh, Ms. Karma Yonjan uh, for the overall uh, recap or say for overall remarks of the training that we have conducted for three days. Uh, after your uh, remarks, we will be uh, going to the closing session. So I would like to request uh, Ms. Karma Yonjan for the overall review or say overall remarks of our training session, please. Uh, thank you very much, Shobaji, uh, and thank you, Deepakji. Um, I think it will be <laughs> a big challenge if I have to recap everything all over again, but uh, I would like to focus a little bit about what we will do as uh, next steps. Uh, so, um, And I would like to express my appreciation for the very uh, active participation of all the participants and the strong ownership from Department of Road and Mopit and even uh, Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conservation. Um, my only uh, biggest regret is not being there uh, in person with you all. Uh, so uh, I was just expressing this to Bupendra Ji also earlier. Uh, but anyhow, I think uh, we have achieved the objective of this training, which was really to impart uh, knowledge and information on uh, how to design, plan and implement um, uh, environmental friendly, ecologically friendly uh, linear infrastructure, particularly roads. Uh, so I would like to uh, thank the, the real active participation and dedication of everyone. 
Um, just a few words on the next step. So since everybody has worked very hard and done this group exercise, uh, which uh, has been very nicely designed by Clara, Clara. So this information will be uh, taken forward and compiled into a white paper. So it will be like a white paper with an action plan with the action activities which you prepared um, in terms of how to move forward the agenda of better integrating um, green uh, ecologically friendly features in transport infrastructure. Uh, so this will be compiled into a paper and it will be submitted uh, to the government. Um, and uh, then, of course, it will be up to the government to for the next steps to implement it. But uh, on ADB's part, uh, we will already be actively looking at the action items which have been input by the participants. And uh, as we heard, there are a lot of projects which are in the pipeline. So then we will look to uh, implementing those action items uh, as part of you know, the future projects uh, as we move forward. So just want to let you know that all the hard work and efforts put in will not go to waste. We will uh, convert it into an actionable document. So yes, so I just wanted to yeah, emphasize that the hard work will not go to waste. Uh, we will do something with all the actions that have been uh, input in, in the table and uh, we will continue our efforts in order to take actions on all these uh, initiatives which have been uh, put down uh, in, in the form of, of the table. And uh, we are very um, happy and grateful that um, Nepal is really our champion in moving forward uh, the green infrastructure agenda. So uh, with that, I will hand back to you, uh, Shovaji. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karma, for your beautiful words. Uh, actually, Nepal is uh, uh, planning to have all the development works related with the uh, uh, say linear infrastructure that are to be conducted now that may be uh, environmental friendly. Uh, our government has recently uh, uh, published the uh, document or say it has approved the guideline also with related to the wildlife crossing. Uh, so our ministry or uh, department will always be in concern with these issues. Uh, as I already said that the development works is not for only human beings. Uh, it is uh, ultimately linked with ecology. So these concerns are the concerns of our ministry as well as nation too, as we have signed so many documents regarding to this ecology or say biodiversity conservation. Uh, this program uh, may uh, pause, uh, this may uh, this program may uh, help or support uh, further uh, implementation or planning for our designs. Uh, many engineers from our ministry departments and many other stakeholders are here so that we can uh, uh, plan according uh, to the uh, this uh, program has let us know what about this infrastructure, how should we plan our development structure so that the wildlife uh, friendly uh, or say biodiversity uh, conservation can be held. Uh, I think uh, uh, from this uh, three days training, I got to uh, know lots of things about the uh, this uh, infrastructure and the relation uh, in environment. Uh, I think all our participants are also actively participate in this uh, program. They have developed action plan that how we can move forward uh, according to the situation we have having in our uh, uh, ministries. Uh, this action plan would also help to uh, make a roadmap for how we are going to implement these infrastructures in our uh, conservation areas. Uh, on behalf of participants, I, I would like to thank all the organizers uh, who are involved in this uh, training, uh, uh, resource person or say experts, experts from national as well as international uh, levels. Uh, they have given so much knowledge to us. Uh, actually, we, we get so many information regarding to the biodiversity conservation, animal wildlife crossings. Uh, we get to know whether underpass or overpass is uh, good for our infrastructure, what we can afford uh, 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 literally, we can afford to our uh, uh, say, uh, crossings for the animals. Uh, so on behalf of the, all the participants, I would like to thank especially uh, the team who are involved uh, in this uh, uh, program, who are directly or indirectly with us. Uh, from the moderator side also, I would like to thank all the uh, members here. 
think we should move forward for the closing session. Uh, first of all, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Rudy uh, Vandil, Unit Head, Portfolio Management Unit, ADV Nepal Resident Mission. Rudy's unit is responsible for administrating ADV finance projects in Nepal. From 2010 until 2019, he worked as a social sector specialist in ADV on various education projects in Indonesia, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. He has a PhD in sociology, a master's in public administration, and a diploma in computer science. So I would like to request Mr. Del for the closing remarks, please. I actually selected this background partly based on our uh, topic. Because the, uh, this is the farm where I live when I'm in the Netherlands, and where we also look after safety for animals. That's why. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for giving me the floor. I think you had a very intensive three-day training program and on a very interesting topic, planning and design of smart infrastructure for biodiversity protection. I can understand from the discussions I just heard that all of you really participated actively so that you can get a specific output. And uh, Karma tells us that we're gonna make a white paper which of course is a really uh, important advisory document so that we can get green roads and smart infrastructure institutionalized in Nepal. I looked at the schedule and it looks like it's a really very wide range of topic that you covered. And what I really liked was that you combined theory and practice and actually went to the NB road, you know, and got Budwa road to look at wildlife passes that are being constructed but also for the Narangate Tauda Patiala Road, where we can see that it might be needed for the future. And Nepal will, of course, expand and upgrade significant its transport infrastructure, because we still have a long way to go. And a lot of it will be on the east-west highway, but also the railways in the southern part of the country. So improve your close water connectivity. But this is also one of the most important ecological landscapes. And we understand that there's a lot of protected areas and, and the famous uh, Bengal tiger, tiger and the horned rhino and the Asian elephant are all living there. And this is actually one of the most critical biodiversity areas in Asia. So we are, I think, ethically and morally bound to protect it as much as possible. And I think some great progress has been made already in the collaborative efforts from the government and conservation areas. And the population of the tiger and the rhino is actually increasing. And we can find them all over this Terriarch, uh, Terriarch landscape. But if we really gonna implement all those plans to expand and improve the transport infrastructure, we do need wildlife friendly approaches to make sure that those conservation successes are not undone. And for that, I think several policies have been made. I understand there is a comprehensive and a forestry policy from the government of Nepal. There's a guideline for wildlife friendly linear infrastructure from the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conversation. And all of these are very useful, especially if we want to uh, implement wildlife friendly linear infrastructure because they somehow need to cross that road in a safe manner. But I also think that apart from policies and guidelines, you will learn about how to get online resources so we can really make evidence-based decisions by collecting data, by conducting ecological impact assessments. And I am really happy to learn that you not only learned about this theory, but actually where confronted with those tools, and that some of them are actually already being used when you do ecological studies. So ADB is happy and privileged to be a major financer of transport projects in Nepal. We all know that connectivity needs to improve drastically to good equitable socioeconomic development. But at the same time, we also want to support you with capacity development and other ways to 
make sure that we have sufficient knowledge on biodiversity conversation, conservation so that our projects really follow the do no harm approach. And this trading program, of course, is one of several events that we want to organize on the topic of green infrastructure. And we look forward to conducting more and working with you on that. And as a closing, I would really like to extend my appreciation for the excellent cooperation with my friends from Moped and DOR. And also, it's good to see that such an uh, important and large organization is now one of the champions for promoting green and transport infrastructure in Asia. So we can not only learn from the rest of the world, but the, learn, the world can also start learning from us. I also like to thank the, let me do it properly, the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conversation and the Forestry Department that you supported and collaborated in the study and all, sorry, in this workshop and also in addressing forestry and biodiversity issues when we do road projects. And thanks again to all the participants, virtual and those who went over there. I do echo Karma's comments that it would have been great if I could also have made it, but it was not possible. But I do. Uh, assume that the people who really needed it, who really would benefit the most from this, could go and could make an action plan that was based on the, what was learned and also what based what was seen when you went into the, into the land. So with this, I'd like to give the, the floor back. And, and once again, thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Hill. As you mentioned, Nepal has so many conservation areas and we have to uh, develop or see, we have to construct our infrastructure inside this uh, conservation area also. While constructing this infrastructure, we are following the so many uh, environmental rules uh, that can make sure that uh, the biodiversity is not uh, harmed so much. Uh, we are always concerned about the protection of the environment and wildlife conservation. Uh, again, we uh, are planning more about it. Uh, this training has also given some highlights or say uh, some technical know-how, how we can construct all these infrastructures uh, in the conservation area and what would be suitable for the specific location. Uh, uh, thanks again uh, and for uh, your uh, commitment uh, to the technical support again. Uh, as uh, we have planned, our uh, DZSR would have been uh, arrive for closing remarks, but, uh, but for uh, some reasons, he cannot join us. On behalf of uh, DZ, of DOR, I would like to request Mr. Susil Babu Takal, PD, uh, ADV office, for the closing remarks. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Subhaji. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, respected Rudy Van, uh, Ms. Karma and all ADV team, including Deepak Sir, Bhattar Sir, uh, X Force, uh, my colleagues, all participants. Uh, thank you very much to all of you. On behalf of Director General of Department of Road, I am going to, uh, you know, deliver some words on behalf of him because he could not attend. Uh, this uh, program. Yeah, the three day training regarding the planning and designing uh, in, in the, in the uh, you know, in the consideration of the biodiversity conservations. It is the, you know, era of development, infrastructure development in Nepal. And now the integration between the civil engineering and ecological science is the subject matter to be you know, considered and to be uh, you know, disseminated among the peoples and among the stakeholders. And the natural capital and their substantial use is the you know, main message to, to, to understood by the uh, respected professionals, uh, respected agencies how to preserve the natural capital, how to use the natural capital in a sustainable manner. Yeah, in the three-day training, the experts are focused on how to communicate, how to uh, make the stakeholders, the participants from the different stakeholders aware about uh, the issues. Yeah, the uh, experts try to 
uh, communicate and uh, make aware about the bioengineering beauty, which is the added benefit, benefit to the uh, civil engineering, uh, you know, the structures. And in the training, the economic uh, tool analysis also uh, presented by the expert. And there is always the trade-off between the economy and environment. And there is always a debate between the uh, experts in the relevant field and the, you know, the executive agencies, because there is a, some constraint to be faced by the executive agency. And we learned the uh, economic analysis tool, shall we do, and there is a sort of trade-off between the economy and environment, and which we learned, I think the experts are also very satisfied with this presentation. Yeah, we are very happy to, to, to have opportunity to, to visit the site. Uh, there were the experts uh, uh, we, have the, uh, we have provided the very inside knowledge at the site, and we have visited the Naraharbutul site and the, uh, you know, the Pothalaya Etoda Naran Ghat, which is under the design by the design consultant and how to address the biodiversity vulnerability in the design. This, this is the crucial issues and we have discussed very frank, frankly and the experts are also understanding the problem faced by the education agency. But at the end, our goal was common. Our, our, we, we accepted the output shall be the same. Our goal shall be the same, but we have to make a sort of trade off between the economy and environment. Yeah, really glad to talk with uh, Mr. Gordon. He, is, he has a very big experience in the geotechnical field and the bioengineering field. And also, I am very happy uh, to, to, to have uh, the assignment uh, along with my friends, the participants, and the you know, way, of, way of you know doing this exercise the assignment by the Clara. It was so effective. And we tried to, to, to internalize the challenges, the needs, and opportunities. We uh, prioritized them, and we, make an, we made an action plan, a number of action plans. So it, it, this, this uh, training uh, became a forum to have a common understanding among the different stakeholders, because there are a number of participants from the different, different stakeholders who sat together in the groups. And we make an action plan. We make prioritize the action plan, and finally, we, it is in our hand. This is an example, and we, we, can, we can solve the problem in a collaborative way. And what is the effectiveness of the collaborative, collaborative and coordinated management? Yeah, we, we, this is an example. Yeah, for our kind of information, Nepal is in the phase of the infrastructure development. And this is the opportunity. Now we have the plenty of opportunity. We can use the best practices in the world. We can use the best results, uh, which, which provided by the you know particular type of the you know technology, particular type of the you know structures. Uh, yeah, this can we can replicate in Nepal, and the best use of technology is a better option also. In this context, I found myself and the, all my friends, participants, are lucky to be a part of this training. I congratulate my friends and participants. I express my gratitude to express for their ded dedication and support. Similarly, I express my special thank to the experts for their dedications and uh, you know making the presentation very effective. Uh, finally, I thank EDB team, Mr. Duri, Mr. Bruce, Ms. Karma, Bhattasar, Deepak sir, uh, for their close cooperation and support. Finally, I express my sincere thank to all participants for their you know, sincere participation in the training program. I hope uh, your stay in the Saura was excellent. With these words, I like to conclude my remarks. Thank you very much. Mostly.